Ani Kinawea, Minogajep, good morning. Thank you all for being here with us. Uh, my name is Samantha Naganash. I am the Lands Manager and I am your host for this year's Indigenous Lands and Resource Management Conference. Um, before moving forward, uh, we'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the situation that's occurring in Europe. Uh, we'd like to say that we are privileged and grateful to be able to be here to gather today in a safe space and connect with all of you. Um, further, we'd like to acknowledge the land. We respect and recognize the inherent rights and governance of the Anishinaabek Pre-Confederation. We acknowledge the rights of the Anishinaabek as legally recognized in the Robinson Huron Treaty of 1850 and the Williams Treaty of 1923. Indigenous people in, in our area are of Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi lineage. Mohawk people from the Haudenosaunee Confederacy also reside in the area and have historical connections um, to both Southern and Eastern Ontario. So we are so excited to be hosting our seventh annual Indigenous Lands and Resource Management Conference this year, which also happens to be our 10th year of our SAR program at Magnetowan First Nation. As we look back and reflect on how all of this has started, we're so proud and happy and thankful to be able to be here with you guys all today. Um, and we're proud to be uh, working together on the coast of Georgian Bay and across Turtle Island. Um, although we look forward to seeing everybody and meeting everybody in person, like this is the best that we could do this year uh, with COVID. Um, but we still look forward to hopefully being able to meet in person uh, next year. Um, so Magnetowan First Nation is within the Georgian Bay, Mininogami Biosphere region, and is located on the Magnetowan River near Britt, Ontario. Magnetowan First Nation is 4,700 hectares of land with beautiful mosaics of wetland, forest, and rock barren habitat. Our Department of Lands, Resource, and the Environment work close, closely with both leadership and the community to facilitate and develop programs, outreach, and research. Uh, speaking on behalf of our department, we are proud to host this conference this year, since 2014, to bring people together, build partnerships, and ensure sustained protection of our lands and resources for seven generations and more. To get us started in today's webinar, we're so fortunate to have Christine and Hilton King, who have again graciously agreed to help us start our conference in a good way. In preparation for this ceremony, if you could please grab a glass of water if you don't have one. Uh, you may also participate in the smudge if you have your own, or you can be holding tobacco during the ceremony, again, if you have some with you. At this time, we'd like to uh, request your presence with us at every moment in this webinar. And I uh, would like to hold off on using the chat until the very end so that we don't miss anything. Um, but as Elena mentioned, please use the Q&A feature to submit your questions and we'll present those uh, to the speakers during the question period. So Jimmy Gwetch, Christine and Hilton for being here with us today. Um, and I'm gonna hand it over to you guys. We're going to start off with a smudge, start off in a good way. And um, this smudge, for those of you, as I'm sure a lot of you know that, um, you know, this smudge is, is we're asking the smudge, this medicine to help us at this time to bring good thoughts, hear good things, say good things and feel good things. And we always use the medicines when we're, you know, using song or prayer and because we're acknowledging where um, we're acknowledging where all these these things come from, you know, they come from somewhere and so acknowledging those in that good way. So I'm going to offer offer the prayer in the language. <clears throat> Chimi Gwetch Mashomas, Nagabi Wase, Arje in non gum. Chimi Gwetch Nakit non gum, Kija Gut, where Manager Mano, Ganawa Mog, Niki, where Jibamadis, meanwhile, where Manager Gano no. Me Gwetch Kaish Kimikwe, Ogomija young, Mat so win. Ogomija young, me jum. Ogomija young, nebe. Ogomija young, we say yuck. Meanwhile, Ogomija young, ye so win. 
Sama, Nabagdana, Wabana, Jauna, Nagabiana, meanwhile Givedna, Naramoshin Jamoshka Gabuyan, meanwhile his own day on. Kenege go Gamijayang, O Safa Madza win, we do Kushnang. Janabayang, Quayak, Jabamus say yang, to me which gives him one ado. Gamijayang gets sanon, me which Gabano Jinon, we win a Jamaji coin. Um, and um, that prayer is uh, just just a little prayer. Um, and it's Ojibwe, Ojibwe morning prayer. And it's honoring um, everything in creation, you know, because as I said earlier, you know, honoring where life comes from is, is one of our original instructions. So that, that keeps us humble, you know, keeps us know where, it helps us know where life comes from and that, you um, um, you know, we, we, we ask creator to, to see us and hear us. So miigwech and um, I'll, I, think, I believe we're going to do a song, me and my Donis. This is my daughter, Christine. And so miigwech Donis. Miigwech. What are we singing again? We're Just kidding. Singing a song. Wait a second. ago when I visited uh, Trent University and uh, the words are miigwech gejemanado so miigwech thank you creator um, the second verse was the way that I learned it was Canada we love you and not that I don't love Turtle Island and where I live but um, I've changed it to Mother Earth so over in my neck of the woods, I learned how to say Mother Earth is Akikwe. Other places say Shkakmikwe. Uh, so over here we say ak Akikwe. And so it's Mother Earth, we love you. So you can change it to whatever you want. I've also put a friend's, um, her child's name in that song as well and sent that to her. So it's just, it's an offering. It's not just, it's a beautiful song. And it's an offering of thanks for today. And as Sam had mentioned, um, for what's happening in our world too. So we think about um, how uh, privileged and how grateful I am to be living over here where we are. Uh, so we're gonna move on to the water and that's me again. <laughs> so if you have your water, you can hold it. Uh, I'm holding a copper a copper vessel. If you don't have copper, that's totally okay. Your water is still going to be prayed for. And why we're praying for the water is because we're, we want to take in all of that goodness. 
And so when we pray to our water, we're putting all of our good thoughts and we're putting all of our, all of our love and all of our, our, um, our humility, even because uh, without water, we really can't survive. Uh, we're made up of as much water as mother earth is made up of. So I think that's pretty cool. And the other really cool, interesting fact that I probably shared last year and I share all the time is that this water is so old and this is what we need. And we see water is life and it truly is life. So I'm thankful for the times that I have to turn on my tap and I have clean drinking water. Uh, because even within my region, which is in the Robinson Huron Treaty region, uh, there's places, communities who don't have clean drinking water. And so we put our thoughts and our prayers for those communities and for those ones who don't have clean drinking water. <clears throat> I didn't even introduce myself ever. So, Wabkinikwe, Dishnikaz, Mikazet, Odam, Wasoxi, Donjava, and Nishnavikwe, and Dao, Nijo, Medeo. I also am known as Christine. That's my English name. Uh, my family calls me Wab. Uh, family and friends call me Wab. And that's part of my, my Nishnavi name, which is Wabkinikwe. So, just to scale back, I was distracted. There's a bunch of squirrels outside my window <laughs> and birds. My, my bad. Um, so I'm going to offer a, uh, a water song that was um, shared with one of my aunties in our lodge. And her name is Doreen Day. And if you know the song, you can sing the song. I hope people are starting to learn the song because it is a song that she shared for the world to know. She wanted the world to know this song, to be able to sing this song. And there's actually a study that, has, that was being done by Dr. Emoto on water as well and so when you're praying to water when you're saying kind words to water there are these depictions of it for me that look so beautiful and then there's other depictions that the water doesn't have as much as a beautiful shape to it some people might find it nice so that's i'm not judging but um we'll say i'll, I'll sing this song <clears throat> i'm only gonna sing two verses me is <laughs> So the other thing I like to share too is when we think about those uh, beautiful images and we think about how we talk to people and how people talk to us, that's what I think about those images that come to my mind. Uh, so I really try hard to, to choose my words with kindness. Uh, I can speak my truth and I can do that with being kind. I can share that uh, being kind. Um, so yeah, miigwech. And we're going to, um, we're going to share a little bit about um, land-based connection and I'll pass it back to my day day for this part. Oh, miigwech. Miigwech, Jonas, and um, for that beautiful song and um, those, um, those teachings about the water. <clears throat> and also for uh, Samantha and Christine for acknowledging the, um, the people, you know, over there in, um, in the West and what they're, what they're going through now. So offer our prayers and our Sama to, to them. Um, <clears throat> I think one of the things, you know, when, when um, Christine and I were talking, I thought about this after and, and how, you know, um, the land is such a precious, um, a precious item for us. And, and sometimes we forget about that, you know, that, that um, you know, without, without the land, you know, we don't survive. 
you know, and so you know, when, I, when I was thinking about that, um, it reminded me of um, one of our teachers, um, Jim Dumont, an Abedis say, um, he was talking about how the, um, the land and what, what the land gives us is, is so important for us to, to acknowledge that. And he talked about, um, he was talking about when we do a sweat lodge. When we do a sweat lodge, we go and we, we offer tobacco for the, for, the, for the saplings that we're gonna take from the land. And then we, we cut the tree down. And then, and then he says, no matter how sacred that lodge is, he says, you have to build a relationship with that tree, with that sapling. And when he shared that, you know, it was because I, I, you know, I've done a few sweat lodges. I built a few sweat lodges and, you know, picked many grandfathers off the land, picked many medicines. And um, my teachings were at the time that I offer that tobacco and, and talk to that and talk to that medicine, but never thinking any further on how that, that little sapling had its life planned when it came here as that seed. And that seed, that seed thought, I guess, when Jim talks about that, he talks about the creation story, that's part of that. And then, so when that little tree is growing, you know, it, 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 has, it has intentions of growing and, you know, he's gonna grow up, he's gonna give medicine to the people, you know, he's gonna give, uh, food to the birds he's going to um, create shade for for whoever and he's he has all these intentions of, of growing up and being his part of creation and then we come along and then we cut down the sapling so there goes that tree's life and so I was listening to that and when you listen to Jim you really have to listen to him and I'm going to say because he's a very um He's very um, connected to, to that, that understanding, you know? And so when I heard that, I went, that is so true because if, if we go and we're following our original instructions on how um, this land gives us life, that's where I went. I said, that is so true. So, you know, the next time I go, when I, when I go to, and it will be, you know, I know I'm gonna make another sweat lodge. I know I'm gonna pick more medicines. I'm not going to pick, you know, whatever off the land. I'm going to build that relationship with that land because that's what has given that they've given that, that life to me so freely, you know? So when, when I go and I do that, um, I am going to talk to that. I am going to, I am going to honor that, that life of that tree or whatever I'm going to take from the land because that the spirit of the land is that's what we have to acknowledge as Christine was talking about the water, you know, the spirit of the water, everything, our understanding is that everything um, has spirit and everything is interconnected, right? So we all go through this life um, together and we all rely on each other. That in, in like before uh, 1492, you know, when, when, when the, the invasion of Turtle Island happened here, we had all these teachings and we had this way of life. It, it, you know, like the, our songs, our, our, um, our singing, you know, our praying, that, that's not a religion, that's a way of life. And that's what kept us connected to that land. That's how we became what they call, some of us call us the stewards of the land. You know, that, that's, that's what we have, that worldview. So, um, Again, I, I just want to thank all the organizers, you know, for the, um, you know, bringing everybody together because this is important. You know, this is very, this is a very important time in, in our lives. And, you know, um, again, the, the people over there in Ukraine, you know, they're, they're being forced off their land, you know, in, in, in a very violent manner and, and thinking of them and praying for them and not to take anything away but indigenous people here have been forced off the land. So we know the impact of, of what they're gonna be going through is gonna be, be a long time. But getting back to that worldview, that understanding that Chicago McQuag gives us life. That's what, that's what we'll keep in mind. 
So um, I don't want to say too much more because I know my Donis has uh, uh, more just more just talk on that. So I want to say miigwech and I'll pass it back to Christine. Miigwech. Miigwech. Uh, yeah. So the um, what um, my day day was sharing about the connection to land. I feel that uh, since we grew up in our community, the connection to land was always uh, enforced for us. Uh, we were kicked outside to, to, uh, to play. And recently we were asked, what's your favorite toy? And I didn't have a favorite toy because we were always outside. And <clears throat> more recently in recent years in my uh, later life, I began hunting and that connection to land became even stronger for me to understand how precious life is and how <clears throat> all of our relatives, all of the, the trees, the plants, the animals, how they sacrifice their life for us so that we can survive. And a part of our creation story, uh, Nishinaabe was la uh, last to be lowered to earth. And as Anishinaabe was coming down and being lowered to earth, the, their toes were pointed so that they, they didn't want to disrupt the beauty that they were seeing as they were being lowered. And so as they were being lowered, their toes were pointed so that only their toes touched the earth. And when I think about we were the last to be lowered uh, and how the rest of creation, Nindwe, Maganaduk, all of our relatives, how they could survive without us. They could survive this living without us, but we can't survive without them. So the work that's being done today uh, with various organizations in our, in our territory is for the preservation and for the revitalization of our land as well. And I'm so thankful to see all of the programs that are creating awareness about some of the, the species, especially that are at risk. And I remember in the summer, I was uh, up, at, up at Magneto and we were doing a turtle releasing and I was with my coworker, my friend and on our way back, we, we uh, helped a blanding cross the road. And I, uh, text, I text Alana right away and I said, what is this? <laughs> what kind of turtle is this? And she said it was a blanding. And so that awareness is being created by us participating in this, the knowledge that's being shared. And we're also sharing our knowledge too. So why I was up there was we were having a releasing ceremony for those, those babies that were uh, going to be populating the, the turtle population again. And so in that there's a knowledge exchange that happens. So from the Species at Risk program, they're sharing the knowledge and the importance of ensuring that the populations are healthy. Uh, it's the same with the moose population in our area too. It's healthy again. And that's through education, that's through awareness, that's through having a connection, having a relationship to land. And so I know there's a lot more species that are being um, uh, research. One of my, my good friends who I seen on here, Jordan, uh, she works with fish. And I think that's pretty cool to see her, her uh, posts about that too. Uh, but that we continue to educate and we continue to do this knowledge exchange of how as Anishinaabeg, um, we take care of the land. And that knowledge exchange is then with our, with our partners and with our allies the knowledge that they're sharing with us and how we can do that sustainably as well. And so in that too, is the revitalization of our original names for our territories and the revitalization of our language. Um, Barb Nolan, uh, she uh, was in a session and she was quoted that language and culture are inseparable. Language and culture go hand in hand. And so as we're doing this work, I see that within these organizations, I see the language being revitalized because that's part of who we are. And the more that we add language even into our own everyday vocabulary, we're revitalizing that, that language and our Gete and Nishinaabeg, our ancestors are looking on, on, on us and, and going, oh, okay, they didn't forget. And so, no, we didn't forget. It was um, just taken away from us. And so now we're, 
where, um, as Onabanase says, Nishnabe Piskabe Yang, and Nishnabe are returning. So we're returning to our teachings, our, to our ceremony, to our understanding, to our ways of knowing, being, seeing as well in life. And that's what we want to do. And that's what we're showing those generations who are coming behind us. So this work that we're doing today, it's causing an effect that's coming seven years um, after us. So we're doing this work with purpose. And as my day day was talking about um, purpose, we all have purpose. All of creation, Nindwe Maganaduk, all of our relatives, we all have purpose. I also would like to acknowledge the, um, the two people that I've seen introduce themselves, James, and I think it's Alicia, all the way from the East Coast. Miigwech for, for coming and joining. Miigwech to the um, to SAR program over in Meg for putting this on and for inviting us to come again. I was uh, super excited to do this again. It always fills my spirit and my heart to see all of the work that's being done. And to me, gratitude to my day day for always coming along with me too. <laughs> when I ask him, so you wanna do this with me? <laughs> so you wanna do that with me? <laughs> and so I'm very thankful that I have my day day here with me to do this as well. To me, Gwetch, and have an awesome day, everybody. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Miigwech. Miigwech. Miigwech, y'all. Jimmy Gwetch, Hilton, and Christine. Uh, it's so awesome to have you here uh, to start us off. And, and for speaking to uh, the importance of the connection to the land and for acknowledging um, how great it is that we can all gather and share all of our work. So to kick off our presentations, I am going to reintroduce Alana and Nadine, who is going to be presenting on our programs here at Manawan. So Alana is our speech service biologist and our uh, program coordinator. She's been in the position for three years and is grateful to have been connected to Meg Nadawan since conducting her master's thesis uh, work with McMaster's University in 2015. Alana has been lucky to, she's turned her childhood hobbies of catching reptiles and amphibians into a full-time job. And she thinks summers spent at her family cottage near Perry Sound. Um, Nadine is our conservation biologist. She's been working for us since 2018. Uh, her responsibilities as the wildlife specialist also include leading our turtle trauma first aid center and our incubation program. She has a bachelor degree majoring in biological science and minoring in zoology from the University of Guelph. She has a diploma as a fish and wildlife technician and she took conservation and law enforcement program. Uh, so you can learn more about them in their bios, uh, but here are my wonderful SAR team. Take it away, ladies. TV Gwetch Sam. Um, so I just shared my screen there. Hopefully everybody can see that. Um, and I'm just gonna turn my camera off. Um, we are still wearing masks in our office, so um, you'll be seeing enough of my face throughout the day anyway. So I'm gonna turn my camera off. Um, yeah, also, I just want to say, uh, Christine and Hilton, I know I bumped you over to the attendee area, but if you can still hear me, uh, Chimi Gwach for, for being here and opening this day in a good way. Um, one of my favorite pictures of Christine is when I took of her last year holding a baby turtle. I don't think I've ever seen anybody so excited to hold a baby turtle. Um, so it's always wonderful to have you guys here. Um, so to kick things off, uh, I figured we at the Lance Department could tell you a little bit more about ourselves and what we've been doing the last few years. So we re recently revamped our social media, uh, thanks to one of our staff, Brooke Carroll. Uh, that was all her, so thank you so much. Our new handle, you can see up on the screen now, at MegaFen Aki on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, we've also been doing our best to revamp our website, so we encourage you to check that out. So as Samantha said, um, my name is Alana. I'm the Speech at Risk Biologist and Program Coordinator here. Ani Nadine Paro and Dijnikas, and I'm the conservation biologist and wildlife specialist. So we often joke around that we share a brain and, and finish each, each other's, other's sandwiches. sandwiches. <laughs> uh, uh, most of the time, we don't even need to ask to do something because the other person is already doing it. Um, so Nadine, thanks for being you. <laughs> 
Um, although we are a dynamic duo, we are also part of a much larger team and community who support and inspire us in all aspects of our work. We want to take this opportunity to personally acknowledge every single person that has contributed to the success that is the Magnetowan First Nation Lands Department. This slide only scratches the surface of all the people who have supported the SAR program at Magnetowan, including previous land staff, community members, and leadership. This year, the program is entering its 10th year of existence, which is absolutely incredible. <laughs> Um, we are inspired on a daily basis by these incredible individuals and those that came before us. It's because of their commitment to positive change and their connection to Mother Earth that we're inspired daily to do what we do. We hope to do them proud today by sharing a few highlights from our SAR program and other departmental initiatives. So as not to repeat ourselves from previous year's presentations, um, we're just going to briefly touch on our Species at Risk program as well as our outreach and education work and discuss some of our departmental responsibilities. As always, our goal is to incorporate the two-eyed seeing approach in all aspects of our work. This concept of weaving Indigenous and Western knowledge systems is incredibly important when it comes to land-based work, um, as Hilton was also describing this morning, especially as we face new and adaptive challenges associated with things like climate change. As many of you know, we at MFN have a long-standing SAR program, 10 years in fact, <laughs> that encompasses many streams of work, including road ecology, population monitoring, and our incubation program. Our road ecology work consists of driving and biking along two secondary highways and the primary Highway 69, where they transect Magnetowan First Nation. Although it can be some pretty grim work, um, we are able to gather important information of hotspots to prioritize for future mitigation. We also conduct targeted habitat surveys that are often guided by observations on these roadways. Supplemented by things like turtle telemetry, we're able to identify critical habitats such as nesting and overwintering sites. Similarly, we conduct opportunistic gestation surveys for Massasauga rattlesnakes, which along with hibernation sites are flagged as key sites for protection. All this work is conducted in conjunction with our population monitoring program. So under proper permits, of course, we notch turtles and pit tag massasaugas in order to uniquely identify different individuals. This allows us to make connections to their health, growth, and distribution. So once again, most of this is um, all thanks to community observations. We also have to give a special shout out uh, to Theodore, who frequently monitors 529 on his scooter and even managed to find a Blanding's turtles of ours last summer who traveled out of her range of our telemetry gear. So Chimi Gwech Theodore for uh, finding her for us. <laughs> the other large part of our SAR program is of course our turtle incubation station on Magnetowan First Nation. Since 2018, we've been collecting turtle eggs located in vulnerable spots along roadways and in construction areas. This year was our most successful year yet uh, with just over a thousand eggs collected. We also combine this with a turtle nest protection program guided by our community observations. So one of my favorite success stories from this last year um, in particular was a turtle nest located on the bank of a road ditch. So that's the photo that you can see um, under the text there. So due to heavy rains last year, this ditch flooded and unfortunately so did the nest. We weren't sure how long the nest had been submerged for, but still excavated the eggs since some studies have shown submerged eggs can still be viable within a specific time window. Miraculously, after weeks of incubation, every single egg hatched. It just goes to show how important these efforts are. Turtles don't have it easy, so we need to continue to do our part to help them. Okay, so while we would love to sit here and talk about our SAR program all day, um, we do do a lot of other fun things um, with our work. So one of the big parts of our job is um, our outreach and education program. So recently we've been connecting with communities um, close and far uh, to uh, present and educate our knowledge and share it amongst each other. So last year we were privileged to head up to Wanapate First Nation and to Wikwemi Khan Unceded Territory and do a presentation teaching the kids about our, the local turtles and snakes of the area. I wanna say a uh, great Chimigwesh to Anthony and Theodore for having us up to 
um, visit, meet the kids, and also spend time on the land and with their land staff. Um, these outreach opportunities are extremely important. Um, knowledge is definitely the key to moving forward and teaching our youth is so important. Uh, we, this also extends and we run similar but different presentations for our adults in, in terms of construction training. So having any staff working on um, within Magneto on First Nation um, gets their star training just so that they're knowledgeable about what is happening and where on the land. And then we are very fortunate to have Alan here. Hi, bonjour, Alan. This is because I'm not only going to talk about I am Alan. I live in Magnolia First Nation. I love their plan. I've been lucky enough to work with these wonderful people, and it's been a lot of fun. I remember when this started, maybe not, but um, I remember when I was little, just seeing them, I was like, this was so cool. I want to join. And I was lucky enough to be able to join and be able to do all this cool stuff, help the turtles, help the snakes, learn how to work with them. It's been so much fun. I've really been lucky. They've allowed me to do a lot of work. Like we've been traveling. They allowed me to go do science norks and I was able to present what I did this summer. Present what we all did. It was great fun. Yeah. I'd say Chimigwech for having me here. Mama P. And so that was Alan. And as you can see from the pictures, and just as he described, he was able to go up to Science North, him and yeah. the other monitoring tech, Darian, who is also a community member, and uh, and teach uh, ra people, random people, but um, random people, but also we had a ton of community members show up and support support the boys, support um, our program, and uh, show an eagerness to learn and just continue to learn. Our community can never get enough of our turtle and snake talks. So further to education, we also enjoy uh, being educated and we've been, uh, we have fabulous partners such as Shared Value Solutions who have helped us develop our own community-based monitoring programs. Um, so they helped us develop skills to do our own river monitoring um, where we can do quality um, and quantity with the kind of changing climate change and flooding and different levels. We've been able to develop uh, projections and continue to monitor this for the years. Um, they've also enabled us to have more in-house GIS mapping capacity. This year we went totally digital um, in our field staff. We were able to record all our data out in the field on wonderful tablets. And this has really eased the ability to um, transfer the knowledge and make it all, put it on maps quicker and access all this information, looking at trends um, in, a, in a more efficient capacity. So we've been really excited to be able to learn those skills. And those skills have really applied to us being able to collaborate with our different um, departments on Magneto and First Nations. So while we would love to focus on climate change and the environment and protecting the wheels of economic development, um, infrastructure never stop. So um, we've decided to go with a collaborative approach um, in project management with our housing staff and economic development. And this has enabled us to help um, mitigate and put in the best management practices for those projects. It also helps us uh, make recommendations on areas um, best suited to these types of projects. Um, and with our land use planning, uh, we've been able to kind of build a large scale 10-year um, plan for, for our community. These applications are also utilized with our drone capacity. Um, and so pulling imagery, aerial imagery, putting it on maps um, and building a, um, a collaborative approach to these with our, our project management and our housing staff. And uh, while you're having different aspects of these same projects, different perspectives, uh, Sarah Blakely, who is a, an American businesswoman, she said, don't be intimidated by what you don't know. There's great strengths to ensure that you're doing things differently. 
And so we like to think that here at Magneto on First Nation, we can not only do things to a, a basic level standard, but we can do them better than that because that is what our land deserves. It deserves the best we have to offer. And using all these tools and assets and skills has, have allowed us to do that. And furthermore, exciting, coming April, 2022, um, the collaborative of the WISE Lab at the University of Guelph and Magnano and First Nation Department of Lands, Resources and Environment have created an ethical space in the online space universe um, that we will be launching of creating weaving ways of knowing. And this will be able to bring people together who want to use two-eyed seeing approach um, and alternate um, perspectives into creating a really um, authentic and safe space to be able to create science and move forward with our knowings. Um, so this will be available. The link is already up and running. It just has a placeholder. Um, we have social media as well. Um, but there'll be resources and areas to um, meet different people who are doing science in a great way um, across a larger platform. Okay, so before we conclude our presentation, we have to give a huge shout out to all of our partners, including academic institutions, local organizations, and other First Nations. We are so incredibly fortunate to be able to work with so many amazing people who have helped us to get, um, who have helped us get where we are today and continue to foster collaborations in the future. We also want to say chini guach to some of our funders who also play a major role in making this all possible, particularly the Aboriginal Fund for Speech at Risk, Environment and Climate Change Canada, and the Indigenous Guardians uh, Network, uh, as well as sponsors for part of today's conference, Shared Valued Solutions. Last, but certainly not least, um, to the community, again, we say chini guach. I speak for all of us at the Lands Department when I say we are honored to work with you all. Like I said, it's your commitment to positive change and connection to Mother Earth that we are inspired daily to do what we do. I'm currently reading Dr. Robin Kimmerer's Braiding Sweetgrass book and recently came across the part where she talks about the tradition that led to a couple planting trees with their wedding vows and how many years later she was able to enjoy the shade and sap of the mature trees. As she put it, she was living in the gift of their care, which I think is a beautiful way to put how we should continue to conduct our work on Turtle Island, not to benefit ourselves, but so that the next generation and generations to come can live in the gift of our care. Chimi Gwetch for listening, um, and I hope you will enjoy the rest of the conference. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and pass it back to Samantha. Thank you, ladies, for sharing about our work here in MAG. Um, great job. Thank you. So our next presenter is Chris Birch. He is the Shawnica First Nation IPCA's project coordinator. Uh, Chris will be sharing about Shawnica's Indigenous protected and conserved areas. Um, Chris, whenever you are ready, you are welcome to share your screen and your presentation. All right, there we go. So just to start off, I wanna say miigwech to everybody uh, for allowing me to make this presentation today. Um, again, my name is Chris Birch. I'm the IPCA coordinator with Shawanaga First Nation. Um, so Shawanaga First Nation is leading the Indigenous Protected and Conserved Area Project on Shawanaga Island. Uh, we are getting help from a Guelph-based consulting firm called Shared Value Solutions. Uh, there are also several local conservation groups that are partners on the project uh, in what we are referring to as a working group. Uh, some of them being Georgian Bay Biosphere Reserve, Georgian Bay Land Trust, Georgian Bay Forever, Township of Archipelago, and Point of Barrow Islanders Association. So some of the things we'll cover is uh, Shawanaga Islands IPCA, our vision, uh, project activities so far, and what's to come. 
So a little bit first about the Shawanaga IPCA is Shawanaga First Nation is the recipient of Target One Challenge funding from Environment and Climate Change Canada to establish an Indigenous protected and conserved area on Shawanaga Island. Over four years, the project started in 2018 and coming up in April, we will have completed our first three years of the project. In this presentation, I'll talk to you about why Shawanaga decided to establish an IPCA and what we've done and some things that are again in the works. So this map here is just uh, showing the relative proximity of Shawanaga Island to um, Shawanaga Landing. So this here, uh, Shawanaga Island IPCA. So this is uh, summarized from the We Rise Together report from the Indigenous Circle of Experts. Uh, an IPCA is lands and waters where Indigenous governments have the primary role in protecting and conserving ecosystems through Indigenous laws, governance, and knowledge systems. <clears throat> so what is the significance for Shawanaga to have an IPCA on Shawanaga Island? So for decades, uh, Shawanaga members have not been using the island the way their parents and ancestors had. Uh, this is for many reasons, including barriers to access and tension with other land users. So when thinking about what motivated Shawanaga to establish the IPCA, this is key. Uh, creating an IPCA can help remove those barriers. Members can reconnect with the island, steward the lands and waters guided by Anishinaabe values, and build an understanding of Anishinaabe knowledge systems, culture, and language among Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. So our vision for the project is that Shawanaga members will continue to use the island and have greater access and manage the island using Shawanaga's knowledge systems and values. Uh, reconciliation with the Anishinaabe peoples and all other inhabitants of the land and revitalize and grow an understanding of Anishinaabe language, culture, and knowledge systems for both Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. So the IPCA is a community-led process. <clears throat> um, as you see here, um, it is led through Shawanaga, Shawanaga members uh, through community meetings, traditional knowledge studies that we release to collect information about what the island means to the individual and uh, how they historically use the island and how they would like to see the island be used in the future. And uh, just ongoing communications with, again, partnering organizations, um, the province, um, communications within the community, um, project updates, and uh, continuously get feedback on where the project is heading. And if we're still in line with um, what Shawanaga community members envision for the project, as well as, uh, so Chief and Council obviously plays a part in this and the Lands Department. And all three of these kind of play into the vision of the management plans events. So since the project began, um, we've held an opening ceremony in um, October 2018 or 2019, sorry. Um, we hosted a strategic planning workshop, uh, hired an IPCA coordinator, uh, myself, uh, made some capital purchases. So some of the capital purchases are docks and a boat. Um, Again, that'll help with the access by providing docks for individuals to be able to uh, gain better access to the island as well as a boat. Um, review of potential governance models and engagement with Ontario, um, potential partnering organizations as well as community. A little more about since the project began. So on the right um, in that word web, those are all words that were um, heavily used during the traditional knowledge studies um, that community members used to ex 
uh, describe what the island meant to them or um, what they envision uses of the islands to be and what should be protected and uh, so forth. So uh, a little more about, again, since the project began, uh, community meetings um, and meetings with the Lands Committee. Uh, again, traditional knowledge and land use studies. And uh, we again, we've developed a working group with local partners. Um, the idea of the working group with the in relation to the IPCA is um, they help us in data collection, um, just general input and expertise in some of the uh, scientific uh background stuff um they help a lot with that uh, again since the project began um we worked with a design company to finalize the logo and to build a website for uh Schwanaga ipca um the logo was created um through a logo contest that was released to the community um the final product was a compilation of a few of the um, logos that were submitted submitted by members and combined to uh, make the final project that or final product that you see here. Um, again, we created the Facebook account. Um, this helps with communications to the general public as well as to community on project updates, um, any activities that we're gonna be hosting, events, them sort of things. Um, we've again, conducted traditional knowledge holder interviews, circulated a land use survey. Uh, we do hold quarterly working group meetings. Um, we've, collected a water sediment and benthic invertebrate sampling um, through our AMP program, our aquatic monitoring program. Um, this also goes to help with a lot of the baseline data in and around the island. Um, also, we do have a SARS team that also has collected information out on Shawanaga Island that will also be used to implement protection measures on the island. Um, we've conducted ecological land classification surveys to gain a better idea of uh, forest um, vegetative community compositions on the island. Um, by doing that, we get to see if um, there are certain areas on the island that are of greater importance and that will help again guide us to protection measures around some of the certain bogs or fens or any of the wetlands on the island and we've uh, more recently been mapping out potential campsites and trail systems on the island <clears throat> um moving forward in the summer like Right now, these are only potential campsites and trail systems, but we would like to be able to start um, just cleaning up out there this summer and getting it ready to have trail systems um, for visitors, uh, just making it a little safe, easier access, that sort of thing. And what's next for the project? So coming up, uh, we have a story, a couple story maps. Uh, that are going to be put onto the Schwanaga IPCA website. Um, on the website as well, there's the story of the island. Um, that was through community input um, and other forms of research. Uh, we've also drafted a management plan. Um, the management plan is not complete at this time like it's still under review but um the management plan is based off of uh again community input um how they feel the island should be used what should be protected what uses shouldn't be out there that sort of thing uh we will be releasing some videos about the man 
about the management plan and the lands department as well. Um, again, we're going to continue to hold quarterly working group meetings. This keeps everybody involved, everybody up to date um, from surrounding organizations. Uh, we plan again to construct proposed campsites and trail systems, uh, present management plan to chief and council. Um, by doing that, that'll if there is anything that needs to be changed, that gives us time to make any amendments and changes to the management plan before the final version is submitted and presented to the province. And we will be continuing to research and apply for additional funding opportunities. Uh, like I said before, the IPCA is only funded for four years. We're just finishing up year three. So uh, this year is our last year of funding through E triple C. So yeah, we will be looking at additional funding opportunities and how we'll also be looking at how we can make this project self-sustainable in the future. Um, again, that is also where like campsites and trail systems and that sort of thing can play a factor. Um, and that's all I have today for you. Uh, so Again, I just like to say miigwech, and if there's any questions. We do have enough time for questions. Um, I did see a question in the Q&A uh, portion here. Uh, so Chris, uh, what is the size of the IPCA? Um, so we're um, finalizing some jurisdictional boundaries. Um, Still, um, but Shawanaga Island consists of 1,020 hectares of forest land and coastline. So that right now is our target. Cool, your target area. Um, so a uh, next question here. For the IPCA lands, does Shawanaga hold title to that land or does another party, uh, for example, the Crown, own that? Um, it is assumed crown land, uh, but historically it's always um, been used and kept after by First Nations peoples, so. Interesting, that's a fine answer. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's one that I don't wanna dig too, too deep into. Sure. <laughs> um, so that was really that was really interesting. Um, thank you for sharing about the IPCA. The logo looks super cool. It's really cool that uh, you were able to take community member input and create that. That's cool. Um, and I was going to ask you if you could put the link to the website for the IPCA in the chat, but I think yeah. it's already there. Uh, I'll re-add it. I'll re-add my contact information, the link to the website and Facebook page. All right. Well, Jimmy Gwich, uh, Chris, for your work over at Shonaga. Yeah, Miigwech for inviting me to present today. Thanks so much for being here. All right. So next up, we have Nikki. Nikki Kamanda is the biologist in Nipissing First Nation. She's a graduate of Sir Stanford Fleming College and Trent University. Uh, she further pursued a master's degree at Nipissing University in environmental science. And currently she is the natural resource biologist for her home community of Nipissing First Nation. You can read more about Nikki in her bio. Uh, but go ahead, Nikki, take it away. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> it works. Um, okay. Yeah. So um, thanks for the introduction. Um, so yeah, again, I'll be I'll, t I'll be talking about uh, Lake Sturgeon today. So I'm just going to bring you from like the land to the waters for about 10 or 15 minutes. Um, I also just wanted to say that um, I haven't practiced this presentation. So I'm going to start my time just so I, I know when it's coming up to 15 minutes. Um, hopefully it's not five minutes, but um, yeah, I just wanted to say that. Um, I also wanted to mention that I am a very quiet person um, and I do avoid speaking, but um, I think I um, need to be doing this to start 
um, sharing the work that we do at, at Nipissing. And I know a lot of people um, are interested in what we do. I just have to have that, um, I don't know what you say, um, that confidence, I guess, to, to be able to speak about what I know. Um, I do have a lot of anxiety and I hope it doesn't come out during this uh, presentation. Um, but um, anyways, so my first uh, slide here, you can see me holding a sturgeon. Um, and I just wanted to like quickly tell you about why I got into this field. So I, I wanted to get in this field because I was um, learning about my culture. Um, so my mom was part of the 60s scoop and didn't know about her family and her culture. So at a young age, um, we as kids were starting to learn about stuff like clans and my mom was learning at the same time. And I just thought that um, these clans and these animals were really fascinating and I was learning about their roles and um, I started reading about like animal behaviors and saw the connections. So I saw, I started reading about animal behaviors and then like ecology and it ended up being stuff about the land and then it turned to biology and science. So um, I've kind of been in this field um, since 2001. So um, almost 20 years I've been going to school and university and been in this, uh, this field for a long time. Um, Another reason why I also I'm in this field is because I wanted to be a wildlife photographer. So um, I actually really studied about what I wanted to do. And then I realized that um, buying that camera equipment was like way too expensive, expensive and that I needed to learn um, about the animals anyways. And I just, I something, it was always something about animals. So that I actually chose fish and wildlife. Um, uh, technician so early in my like studies and then yet yeah, I went to university and and did those environmental studies and then switched to environmental studies and I also studied indigenous studies because I wanted to learn more about um, my culture and the and all of that so um, I just really was interested in how indigenous issues related to the environment when I was in school too so I just thought that was pretty cool that um, I felt like this was a, a really meaningful um, career get, to get into. Um, so now I work for my home community of Nipissing First Nation. Um, I'm very fortunate to be here as the first Anishinaabekwe um, biologist. I've been here since 2011. Um, I've been hiding and slowly coming out of my shell. Um, so my when I first came here, my first responsibility was to track lake sturgeon for movement patterns on Lake Nipissing. So um, it was kind of a new position. Um, I did work at the AOFRC, so the Anishinaabek Ontario Fisheries Resource Centre for a couple of years. So I got a little bit of um, experience there. Um, and then that turned into helping with the Ministry of Natural Resources and Nipissing First Nation on their annual fall walleye um, index netting assessments. Um, and then I was responsible for doing um, fisheries assessments. So I was doing a lot of um, baseline fisheries assessments. So uh, Lake Whitefish. Um, and then eventually I became responsible for collecting commercial uh, fisheries data. So I analyze that data and I update um, the harvests each month and I make recommendations to uh, the natural resources manager and chief and council for um, when those that fishery should be closed just as a way to like um, protect the fish. Um, and I don't want to say like it's it's not like it. I said that wrong, but <laughs> it is a way to like manage fish. Um, so we're just not taking and taking and taking. We have to manage it somehow. Um, so this one, I don't know if you could see this. I can barely see it. Um, so this one little, I don't know if you can see the um, arrow too. So I took this as par um, part of um, one of the sturgeon projects back when I first started here. Um, but I also put out this announcement on social media. Uh, so the main purpose of this announcement was just to get uh, community to start thinking about um, any experience they had with Lake Sturgeon because I want to be able to like collect that information and share it when I do presentations or when I'm doing some sort of education and outreach. It's always nice to get the community's perspective and their experiences, I guess. So, um, 
can't see it so I'll, I don't have to see it I guess so one of the first encounters I had with Lake Sturgeon was when I was um, nine years old I was um, playing at my grandfather's like my grandparents dock and um, I don't know I was just looking in the water and then I kind of just like I, I jumped back and I was like oh my god like I was thinking those are sharks and then I didn't know that uh, one of my older cousins were were behind me and he kind of like giggled at me and said those are those are lake sturgeon and I kind of like peeked over and I'm like I was just really fascinated with lake sturgeon and like I just didn't know that I'd be working with lake sturgeon for um, a majority of my life now it's just it's just pretty cool um so getting into the actual presentation so this is some of the stuff that i'll be talking about today so i'll quickly just show you the study area talk a little bit about um, life history and habitat of lake sturgeon um, go where fisheries management and management efforts um, in the earlier years uh, talk about um, the methodology and methods a little bit of the data so i'll probably just stick to or i am going to stick to age data and some results and then some of the upcoming plans that that are um, set in place, I guess you can say that starting in the in the spring, um, I do realize that each one of these um, points can be a presentation in itself. So there's probably a lot of information that um, I'll want to talk about. Um, so you can see here. Um, the study area which is the lake nipissing watershed so this was also part of my masters um, part of my masters was to collect all lake sturgeon data within the lake nipissing watershed and it included um mostly include included first nations within um this watershed so um yeah i just it just it just seemed like that all the data was all over the place and the main purpose was to just put that data into one one um, paper, I guess, um, for people to to read or um, yeah, I don't know how to say that. So this is Lake Nipissing. Um, this is where most of the data came from. So there's very little data outside of, of Lake Nipissing. Hopefully there's more. Um, I don't know if you could see this arrow here, but um, this is one of the major um, spawning sites in Lake Nipissing. So this is uh, called Sturgeon River. And then there also is another spawning area down here at Chapman Chutes. Um, it's called the South River. So those are where the um, assessments take place in the spring. Um, On to life history and habitat. So um so maturity in general um age of maturity for lake sturgeon occurs late occurs late compared to other fish species um approximately 10 to 12 years for a male and 12 to 22 years for a for a female lake sturgeon so um, they reproduce pretty late um, in their lives um, they spawn in the spring um, as soon as the um, ice is free from the shoreline um, a female lake sturgeon can release on average 100,000 to 500,000 eggs per spawn. However, it has been estimated um, that less than 1% of those eggs released survive to hatch. Um, females will leave the spawning area as soon as they release um, those eggs and males usually remain and wait for, for more females to, to spawn. Um, their spawning habitat, so this is actually at the Sturgeon River, where we do some of our assessments, like it's a little bit down from this area, but that's that's where they spawn. Um, so they do prefer shallow areas with fast spawning waters, usually at chutes or waterfalls. Um, spawning substrate includes clean gravel, rocks, and cobble, which allows those eggs um, to attach, uh, like to those crevices or fall into those crevices and protect them from um, predators. So again, I, I showed you those two areas um, in Lake Nipissing where they where they do spawn. Um, in general, oops, let me go back here. So in general, so Lake Sturgeon, um, there are 18, I don't know how to say this word, um, genera of Asapenzer um, included in 27 subfamilies worldwide. 
Um, there are five species of actually sturgeon living in Canada. Um, some of the other things I want to point out is some external features and some internal features that um, that kind of like make their you their look unique. So um, so the cartilage skeleton is actually one of the internal features that distinguish the species. The other internal feature uh, feature is their um, head. So their head is is just all bony plates. Um, so I think that's pretty neat. Um, two of the more like most noticeable external features is I already talked about their shark like tail um, and the lateral rows of uh, bony plates that extend along like five, um, five areas, I don't know how to say, five sides of the lake sturgeon. So they call these scoots. Um, some of the threats, I, I quickly want to actually just put threats in here too, because, um, well, yeah, it's important. So to begin with, we know that lake sturgeon um, have an extremely like high mortality rate. So less than 1% uh, survive to um, actually at hatch. So I, I mentioned that earlier. Um, water temperatures can contribute to more, uh, mortality and um, uh, mortality too. Um, so some of the past um, and current threats include, um, so like over the past 150 years, lake sturgeon have been fished to nearly extinction. Um, we've talked about, or we've, I guess some, um, it's been talked about, I guess, for a lot. Um, in the past, their habitats were destroyed by dams, pulp and paper mills and forestry pollution. Um, industrial pollution, so such as like um, sewage treatment plants, and maybe a big one is misunderstanding this species. Um, so not learning about this species. Um, and then current threats include, um, so those water flows from dams, you can see here um, a dam, sometimes this water runs really low and sometimes those sturgeon get trapped and, and they, yeah, they just get trapped um, in those areas. Uh, their habitats are destroyed, um, invasive species now. Um, we still do have a lot of like knowledge gaps. So we're still, we're, we actually still are learning about this species. Um, and again, not knowing fully um, or understanding this species. Um, so here, I just have a picture of Sturgeon Falls. So this last picture, so this is the front of the dam. And this is this is the dam right here. So we actually come in through the Sturgeon River here. Here's Minnehaha Bay. And then we go under here and we do our assessments in this area. And then right about here, it's actually really shallow. And that's where they spawn. Um, so yeah. You can see that's where that dam is, right in this area, Minnehaha Bay. So next, um, fisheries management. Um, actually, I'm actually running out of time, ain't I? <laughs> so um, I just really wanted to go. Like I, I wish I could talk more about like the fisheries management. This is actually my favorite um, section of the presentation. So there is a lot of data. Um, it goes back to like the 1860s when there was no data actually recorded. Um, a lot of lake sturgeon were um, commercially fished in the Great Lakes. And then after those fish were like basically taken, inland lakes were targeted. So uh, Lake Nipigon, Lake of the Woods, um, and Lake Nipissing. So there was two uh, commercial fisheries operating on Lake Nipissing. Um, during those years, there were management efforts. So fisheries management goals have changed from minimizing the effects of exploitation to um, efforts of protection, but it has taken years and years to do that. Um, the first part of the, um, the 1900s, I guess, they were using gill nets, and then they totally um, closed the fishery for a few years, thinking that that would help the population, but it wasn't enough time because they didn't know um that 
this fish was a slow growing species, so it wasn't actually enough time. They also did interviews and found out where those fish spawn, um, did some initial assessments in the 60s and 70s. Um, they did have commercial closures again to try to help uh, those populations recover. So in 1903 was the first closure. Um, I think it was just for uh, the spring uh, 1908 to 1917, a full closure. That's when they didn't have enough time. In 1927, they actually started uh, a spring closure. Um, so you can just hear, see here that the highest recorded harvest um, was in 1903 at 86,750 kilograms compared to the final record um, in 1990 at just uh, 382 kilograms. Um, so the fishery was closed in 91, but in 91, um, that's when fisheries assessments really started and um, angling was shut down um, and also um, that's when um, the ministry purchased all lake sturgeon that were called uh, caught in commercial fisheries nets and they biologically sampled those sturgeon and released them. Um, and then I just wanted to quickly go over to size of sturgeon. Um, I can't see, see that. Um, they were um, fairly large. Um, so in 1950, I believe um, they were on average around 100 pounds. And in our assessments today, they're on average um, only 35 pounds. So that's a big difference. You can see here um, a lake sturgeon caught in 1975. This was 188 pounds. This is one of the commercial uh, fishermen. You can see here the pound nets, all these pound nets. You can see how far they go all the way to shore. Um, the reason why they wanted to um, use these pound nets was to um, throw back those little sturgeon um, to, I guess, allow them to um, survive. But they, they, I guess, they forgot that that restricted um, those commercial or those fish to swim to their spawning areas. So they were catching those um, all the fish anyways. Um, this is just kind of what I said. So you can see the closure here, the closures, um, it re was revoked. So one of the things here um, in 1972, uh, the commercial fisheries was considered collapsed, but it wasn't um, until 1991 that they closed the fisheries. So it was um, still going another 19 years after they knew it was collapsed. So um, methodologies, so I just wanted to quickly um, go over like the sources. You can see where all the sources, um, all the information that were put together. And then I use secondary data, so that commercial data, all the biological data, um, any meetings were um, put into um, my master's um, paper. Um, the way I organized the data was in uh, three time periods. So from 91 to 95, um, 2001 to 2005 and 2006 to 2012. And the reason why is because um, you need at least five years to be able to estimate um, the sturgeon population. Um, and it's just a good way to like um, kind of monitor and and, um, and compare over the years how healthy those lake sturgeon are. So um, some of the data that we collect is like the total lengths, fork lengths, weights. We do collect ages. Um, I did talk a lot about age data um, because it's important, but we didn't collect it. Um, and I think that um, that's why I, I focused on the um, age data. Um, we also do try to um, sex the uh, sturgeon when we catch them. Um, that's really important too. Um, the methods that we use is we use large mesh gill nets. So we're out there for 60 minutes. They're they're not in the nets overnight. Um, we try to catch them, um, no netting, yeah, no netting overnight. Um, that's when we do our assessments. They're not very long, only 100 feet long, and then yet yeah, they're biologically sampled. We pit tag them, so um, that's for um, in case that's for um, knowing or monitoring each individual um, lake sturgeon, and then after they're they're live released and all the um data analysis so um 
this is all the stuff that we get from the data. So growth rates, um, age at first spawn, that's pretty cool. Abundance, length weight um, information, length at age, and then those population estimates that I talked about. Uh, this is just a couple, a collage of some of the, the stuff that we did um, back uh, 10 years ago, which I'm actually really excited that we're going to be starting um, this spring. Um, so data and results. So I just wanted to, um, I'm not going to go over all of this. So you can see here that um, there's three time periods. So um, 91 to 95. So it's immediately after the, the commercial fishery is closed and then 10 years past closure and then 15 years. So um, I'll have to skip this, but again, I just wanted to show you another way of how the data was um, um, organized. So the first time period, both uh, locations, the Sturgeon River and the South River, you can see the years and the dates we did the assessments, how many sets we did. Um, also, uh, the temperatures that we did the assessments in. Um, how many, this is just basically how many sturgeon were in each net, um, and then their mean length, total length, and you can see here that no age data was collected in some of these years. Uh, one of the new things that we did in the third time period was to focus on juvenile lake sturgeon. Um, so this was a first um, and was actually pretty neat, and we found that lake sturgeon at a younger age were better to tag. Um, one, because the ages um, when you collect ages from a smaller lake sturgeon, it's uh, more accurate. So um, a lot of the, the papers do say um, that after the age of 14 years old, um, it's harder to count those um, rings. So you know how you would count rings off a tree so you can um, get a piece of the pictorial fin and um, somebody can be able to put that under a microscope and count those rings and, and you can see uh, the age of fish. I think this one's pretty cool too. Um, this is um, age again. So the maximum length of a lake sturgeon in um, Lake Nipissing was uh, just over 1600 millimeters. Um, the oldest lake sturgeon was 97 years old. And right here is a 10 year old lake sturgeon. You can see about, uh, I think it says, uh, I'll just say a thousand millimeters, but I think it says uh, 1,040 millimeters. You can see it's 10 years old. And this was another point that I I um, wanted to kind of like bring to your attention because um, back when the commercial fisheries open, they thought that this was still an adult lake sturgeon and um, they weren't, they, they didn't have a chance to reproduce. So they were still catching um, these sturgeon that they thought were adult lake sturgeon. Um, more age data, so the South River and um, the Sturgeon River. Um, I just wanted to point out here that maybe um, the South River Lake Sturgeon are a bit older than the Sturgeon at the Stur um, Sturgeon at the Sturgeon River. Um, they are separate, so they're they're actually considered subpopulations. Um, they're their own populations. Some of our data had shown that they do migrate together. Um, at some point near the um, oh, the French River, but then they go back to their to where they were spawning um, and where they were hatched, I guess. So they're just two separate uh, populations. Um, I don't know if you can read some of this. So um, yeah, so that's all I wanted to say for this one. I'm out of time, ain't I? <laughs> We are out of time. Okay. I, I don't want to take away your presentation is going so amazing. I'm learning so much about Lake Sturgeon. Oh. Yeah, uh, I, don't, I want you to finish up. I don't have I think I just have these two more slides. Okay, so this last one here is another age one. Um, so I don't know if you could see this. So Lake Sturgeon over the age of 15 are considered adult lake sturgeon. And to be considered an, a healthy population, 
there needs to be 20 or more age classes above that 15 year old, uh, those 15 year old age classes. So you can see here that these lake sturgeon populations aren't that healthy. Um, and I already um, kind of explained that um, aging is a little inaccurate when we age them or age the adult lake sturgeon so it's better to do those juvenile lake sturgeon assessments and one other thing that i just remembered is that it'd be pretty cool to see those juvenile lake sturgeon that were tagged 10 years ago go back to the spawning areas and just see how much they have grown so it has been 10 years since we've done those projects and then the last one is is our um, upcoming plans um, which is our fourth time period of data. Um, so we plan to do this for the next five years, um, all the same stuff, just to monitor and compare that data again and see where that, or how healthy these, these fish are. So those assessments, again, we're gonna be doing larval drift netting. So we'll, we'll be catching those little guys, but we'll be releasing them um, live. So we'll just be taking swabs. Um, it's a new method to, to um, collect genetics um and then sending that off and we'll be able to see like if they're brothers and sisters or who their parents were or something like that um we'll be hopefully collecting more indigenous knowledge knowledge um we'll be doing some more habitat mapping and one of our biggest things that i think we should really be focusing on and and i am um getting that more confidence about speaking about it is the education and outreach. So one of the programs that we do do is that we do is adopt a sturgeon. So um, we do this in partnership with the West Nipissing um, Stewardship Council, and they organize these events to have people come out, adopt a sturgeon, get a picture, and that's an um, that's a time where they can just ask questions, um, a knowledge exchange. So that's with um, you guys, the Magneto One staff. We've invited you to come see. Um, what we do. So that's exciting. Um, just putting this information in newsletters and hopefully next year we want to put a little video together and that's it. And I can probably go on, which I didn't know. So <laughs> I will stop sharing this. Um, so we glitched Nikki. That was an excellent presentation. The chat was going crazy. Everybody was saying how excellent uh, and informative their presentation was. Thank you. Um, so, next, we have Daniela Baker. Uh, Danny is the lands manager for Wasoxing First Nation. She is Anishinaabekwe from Atish, uh, sorry, Atikmishay Anishinaabek. Daniela has made Wasoxing First Nation her home with her family and hopes to continue to service the community and contribute to the growth of the nation. Um, Thank you so much for being here, Danny. Uh, I'm going to let you take it away. I just wanted to mention that there is a question in the period afterwards. So any questions that we have, uh, we'll get to that afterwards. So thank you, Danny, for being here. And go ahead, you can share your screen. Amazing presentation, Nikki. Um, I have no issues with you cutting it short. I uh, talk pretty fast, so I could probably get this in in five minutes. I just Maybe I should introduce myself again. I don't know if Sam was, uh, her mic was really clear. Um, but I'm Daniela Baker. I work with Wisloxing First Nation. I'm currently the lands manager and I've been working with Stan, um, who's still trying to get online. He's hoping to join us from his phone. Um, uh, we've been working with Kilbear for, gosh, it feels like forever, trying to get our harvest up and going at, within the park. It's been over 50 years since both communities have been able to harvest on traditional territory. And just these past two years have been phenomenal. And we are currently working on our third year. We've been getting so many questions about the harvest and I've been pretty quiet about it. Um, I've just been holding it in, experiencing it and kind of seeing where it's going and the relationship building is phenomenal. Um, we've had community members come in just to come and take a look at the deer. They're bringing in their families. We've had food set up, a campfire. So when community members come out of the harvest, they sit around the fire and just share stories. They have marshmallows. 
Um, I don't want to get too much into the safety aspect because I was going to leave that to Stan. Um, if he's a, oh, I see you, Stan. I don't know if everybody can hear him, um, but he is online. So I did just, um, I'm going to make him co-host as well, Danny. So um, hopefully he'll be able to turn his mic on or if he's calling in, um, Stan, just let me know if you have any problems connecting, okay? Great. Um, I did want to mention that our youngest harvester um, was from our first year and she was a toddler. I don't have permission to share her name, but she was the cutest walking the trails with her parents. And that was what the harvest was all about was um, families coming together, sharing knowledge, um, just watching the deer because they're abundant out in Carling and in within the park. Um, the staff were phenomenal. We, for the safety of the, both communities, they were kind of monitoring the border just to make sure there was no um, members of the general public entering the park from any direction. Um, we had um, people at the gates as well. The gates were closed to the public, so nobody could walk through with their dogs. Um, everybody was wearing orange. Our first year we used short range shotguns. Dan, don't yell at me if I said that wrong. Um, and this year we actually introduced bow hunting which was great. We had two community members bring out their bows and I kind of wanted to see it in action, but unfortunately they weren't successful. <laughs> Not like I was walking behind them, but um, we did do health and safety checks just to make sure everybody knew where they were going, where the red zones were, where the green zones were. Uh, we had Shawnigas Lands truck out and with Soxing's Lands truck out to do um, those health and safety checks. I can't speak any more about the relationship building. It's, it's not, it's more than just words on a paper and shelved on a, on a computer or in someone's office. These agreements were actions. They were a more than just a promise. Uh, we were able to really drive this forward for both nations and the outcome was just phenomenal. Um, the knowledge sharing that I can't highlight that any more than I already did. And the traditional knowledge that we were able to just share with um, Kilbear Park staff monitoring the borders, um, explaining why we do certain things, why we give thanks with tobacco, why um, why we kept the fire going for this year, six days. And I believe, um, Stan, I could hear you laughing a little bit there. I don't know if you um, are able to speak or if you're still having connection issues. Hi, good morning. Yes, I'm, I'm here. Uh, I was just driving and uh, I, I wasn't able to connect there for a bit. I can hear you, Stan. Perfect. Miigwech. Yeah, I just wanted to, to hit on some of the points that Daniela made regarding the relationship building. Um, not only did we listen to ourselves and what we need to do for the connection to the land, we adopted what they needed for safety. And, uh, you know, that's part of the relationship building and having two partners come in together and make things work. Uh, it, it's gone a long way. The relationship building between all of us now has... Uh, really shown us true colors and a lot of people are asking how we were able to accomplish this. Uh, the number one thing is respect. We were, we gave Kilbear Park and their staff the respect as well, uh, you know, for safety of their, their people and ours. Is, and uh, we went from there. Um, I think it's, it was a great uh, opportunity, not only for Shawanaga and Wasoxing, but Kilbear as well. They seem to have learned a lot and uh, they have staff there that, uh, we're, we're very accommodating. So I, I appreciate that very much. Thanks, Dan. The, uh, the state, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, that's fine. 
I missed what Daniela hit on at the beginning, so I'm sure she hit on every uh, all the uh, all the different points of safety and uh, everything we went through to ensure that uh, you know year one was the tough year and year two went smoothly. <laughs> I do want to mention that our first year we had I think four weeks to prepare, so we were on the yes. phone constantly, almost every other day, just trying to hit on the safety aspect of the harvest itself. It was, um, it was hectic, but we, uh, we pulled, pulled it off. Couldn't be more proud of everyone we worked with. Uh, we had MNRF, um, AP, no, sorry, OPP. And who else did we have on site, Stan? Uh, MNRF came twice, OPP was out. Um, and I'm not sure who else was involved other than the park staff. Yeah, so we had them all involved. Um, they just came in to say hi, just to check out how we were set up. And uh, OPP did join us a few opportunities on our health and safety checks. Um, not necessarily to check in on anybody, but just to learn and to appreciate um, what we were able to accomplish. And I think it's question period now. Uh, team Gretch, Danny and Stan, we're just gonna test to see if Samantha, Samantha's mic is working now. Testing, testing, one, two, one, two. Okay. You guys can hear me really good? It's perfect. Back, yes. back to normal? All right, perfect. Well, thank you guys so much for, for explaining the work that you had done and that partnership and the work with um, the Traditional Harvest. It's such a cool program. Um, and since you guys had a couple successful years, I thought it would be really awesome for you to, uh, to share. So thank you so much for sharing about that. Um, I did want to open it up for questions. Um, we do have some questions in the Q&A. Um, let me see. So one of the questions here is hunting in the park happening only on specific days or managed events. And could you say more about the red zones and the green zones? Absolutely. So we did, um, for safety purposes, we did work with the park on our first year, which was four days. So we had two days for each nation to come in and harvest. Wisoxi had a registration process. So we knew who was in the park at all times when they came in and when they left. Um, that was a huge safety concern in the event that we had to send out a mass uh, call to all harvesters to disengage. Um, and this year we also, we did the same process except we were doing it for six days three days for Shanaga, three days for Wisoxing. Um, again, it was, it was phenomenal. We were, uh, the park was uh, shut down completely for, to all the general members of the public. Cool, thank you. One of the other questions we have is, uh, wondering if you're monitoring the numbers of deer hard harvested or if you're taking any age data. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm just gonna go back to your previous question. I don't think I answered um, the green oh, zone the red zones. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was green zones where harvesters can go harvest. The red zones primarily um, were the campgrounds and the, area, the, the boundaries next to the cottagers. So we didn't want any harvesting in those areas. Um, but if a deer was harvested near a red zone, uh, harvesters can go in and they can collect the deer and bring it back into a green zone, but they weren't harvested in the areas, just the green zones. And MNRF did monitor the, I think the question was in regards to the amount of deer. Yeah. So yes, we did keep data. Um, MNRF is very data driven and I know uh, I'll get a message <laughs> shortly about uh, 
all the harvest, the deers that were harvested. Um, but we did monitor. Uh, we kept track of the amount of deer. Uh, we monitored gender and age. Stan, did I miss something? Uh, sex as well. Gender. There was, uh, yeah, a lot of uh, data was collected. Um, we do have that on record and we did do it every year. Uh, and it shows that, uh, you know, some of the things that we've done are, are phenomenal. There was actually a uh, antlered female deer harvested this year and that's pretty different. That's uh, unique. I wish you got a picture. I seen that the youth had made a post about that and they called it a two-spirit deer and they were all excited about that. So <laughs> that's cool. Um, one of the other questions that we have are, uh, it's actually from our YouTube stream. So one of our viewers there has asked uh, how, or if you could speak a little bit to developing the relationship during COVID, it's been so difficult to gather in person over the last couple of years to build those relationships. Actually, um, I agree COVID has thrown a wrench in everybody's plans, um, but this, these discussions have been happening probably before since I've started with Wasoxing. Um, I know chiefs of both nations have been pushing for this harvest for years, but the pandemic was a blessing in disguise. The park was shut down to the general public and it was um, I'm not sure how you say it, but it was it was a guinea pig for continued harvesting. Uh, we were able to see how it would go, um, plan for health and safety with without having to worry about the general public. <laughs> but yeah, the, the agreement process was quite the process. Um, and for a while, I felt like it wasn't going anywhere until the pandemic and when the park shut down I that's when we were able to actually get some action going with planning. Nice I'm sure that's something that's been in all of our way is this COVID. Um, so I have another question for you guys Danny and Stan. Um, a uh, quick question though, has it been, has there been testing for CWD, that chronic wasting disease in deer? I think MMR app can speak to that, but no, not to my knowledge. Um, when our deer was harvested, they brought it up to the sugar shack, which is where we were stationed for registration. And they were, oh, sorry, we did take their weight of the deer as well. Um, hmm. But there was a, no data collected, I think, for chronic wasting disease. Um, I wanted to ask a question. To, uh, there are some other questions in our, in our Q&A uh, for our other presenters also. There's a question here for Nikki. Um, somebody was asking who you did your, uh, who you did your master's work with. I don't know if that means uh, your teacher or your um, lab. Um, yeah, it was at Nipissing. Um, it was just a part-time um, master's. So uh, it actually took me four years to do an eight, eight month program um, just because there was so many classes, but it was with Rehan. Rehan was my um, supervisor and um, yeah, I managed to get through it. Miigwech, Nikki. Uh, I, maybe we have time for one more question before we break. Hmm. Pardon me if I, if I skip over anybody. I'm just picking what I see up here. Um, so will the parks be closed down to the public in the years ahead to respect the annual shared harvest? Is, I guess, is this something that's like ongoing? Um, that's set up for years to go or? It's not set up for years to come, but we, every year we just send a notice to 
all Pale Bear Provincial Park that we would be conducting another harvest, which is what we've done for this year. Um, we are unofficially, uh, we are calling it an annual harvest. Um, it's just, I don't think there's a process in place right now to officially call it annual, but um, we've been successful both harvests and we're continuing to keep talking about next year and the year after. <laughs> Yeah, congratulations on that, that awesome work. Um, one other question that I see here is uh, speaking about other First Nations and provincial parks doing this. Um, so I guess, has there been knowledge sharing between um, those parks or our, our nations? Actually, MNRF wanted, um, actually not monitored, they um, adopted a health and safety operational plan from one of the provincial parks down south. I believe they have an agreement with one of, one of their nations and it's been successful. If I, uh, I can actually reach out and find out the name of the First Nation and the park. And if anyone's interested, I can forward that information along. Cool. Hey, Gwesh. So, um, to everyone who has presented so far, uh, we're going to take a 15 minute break. During this time, we're going to be playing some short videos on loop. Um, they've been put together by a number of individuals doing research on and around Magnetowan First Nation in Eastern Georgian Bay. Um, this was our best attempt at a virtual student poster session, um, and we really hope that you'll enjoy. So each student or group has consented to providing their contact information and our follow-up emails to this conference. Uh, so if you have any questions uh, related to their videos, please email them directly or connect with them during tomorrow's Zoom meeting. Um, so without going into too much detail about what's covered in the videos, they include research from Laurentian University, Blazing Star Environmental, Guelph University, Wise Lab, and McMaster's University. Uh, so while we take our break, these are going to be playing on loop in the background, and hope you guys enjoy. When we think of the forest, we have an idea of what animals may live there, and if we're lucky, we may even catch a glimpse of who's been there when we're out on the land. However, there is so much that happens when we aren't around. So how do we learn more about wildlife and their different habitats? At Magnetowan First Nation, the community and lands biologists know what animals are around, but are interested in learning more about their habitats and how they're influenced by development. Using wildlife cameras to perform non-invasive monitoring, two different master's projects were formed to help answer some of the community's questions. In partnership between Magnetowan First Nations Department of Lands, Resources and Environment, the WISE Lab at the University of Guelph, and the Wildlife Ecology and Conservation Lab with the Ministry of Northern Development, Mines, Natural Resources and Forestry, we have put out 56 wildlife cameras across the Magnetowan First Nation Reserve, spaced one kilometer apart. The cameras are set out to cover three main habitat types, rockland, forest, and wetlands, and are targeting medium to large sized animals. These cameras will be used by two students, Claire Kemp and Kate Yarchuk. I will be exploring how medium to large mammals use different habitats, focusing on how their diversity is affected by linear features like the roads, railway, and river. So far, our cameras have picked up a variety of animals, including large mammals and medium mammals. And even though we're aiming for medium to large mammals, this hasn't stopped us from finding non-target animals like small mammals and a whole lot of birds. I'll be looking specifically at moose, thinking about their relationship with different habitats, such as coniferous forests, mixed forests, rock outcrops, and wetlands. And I'll also look at how they're influenced by linear features. Our cameras have seen moose in many places so far. Sometimes these photos even tell us a story, like this moose that walked by and then took a long nap. 
Throughout our work, we have been doing our best to prioritize Indigenous values, especially reciprocity, respect, knowledge transfer, and interconnectivity. Our next goal is to meet with and interview community members to learn about what it means to conduct research on the land in a good way, and other community values that should be prioritized in monitoring. We have been fortunate to have spent a lot of time on the land in Magnetowan First Nation throughout 2021, having been joined by some amazing staff from the lands crew. So far, we have learned a lot, like that some wildlife are just as curious about us as we are about them, and they've been keeping an eye on our cameras. A special thanks to all those who have helped us to plan our fieldwork, shared their knowledge and experiences with us, and of course to the beavers in Meg, whose construction work has allowed us to access our many cameras. And of course, if you see us out on the land, please come say hello. Railways are an important part of our transportation network, but we still don't fully understand how they impact wildlife. This research started when two First Nations communities expressed concerns about the impacts of train collisions on wildlife, particularly at-risk species. This prompted us to study railways, informed by Indigenous knowledge and first-hand observations, to better understand which species die most often along the tracks and which sections of the railway are most deadly. We've conducted three seasons of weekly surveys, and so far we've documented at least 40 different species along the tracks. Unfortunately, more than three quarters of the animals that we encountered were found dead, which is consistent with the concerns of community members. What's even more concerning is that 87% of those mortalities were frogs, turtles, or snakes. Now, reptiles and amphibians are already threatened by things like habitat loss and road vehicles, so railways may be increasing pressure on these already vulnerable populations. Our next challenge is to identify the environmental factors that contribute to the locations of wildlife deaths, then we can suggest informed solutions to help prevent future collisions and to help protect these sensitive species. Ani Bojo. My name is Charles Lefebvre, and I come from the community of Chippewas of Rima First Nation. And like many Indigenous people, wolves hold a very important spot to me culturally and spiritually. Wolves also contribute to maintaining the overall health and function of an ecosystem. I will be focusing my master's research project on eastern wolves, which is a species at risk. I will be using two-eyed seeing, or weaving of knowledge systems, to study the distribution and the behavior of eastern wolves in Magnetowan First Nation, Shimonaga First Nation, and Wakwemekong Unceded Territory. I will be gathering knowledge about wolves in each community and using Western science approaches for genetic testing and radio calling to track their movements. The goal is to understand the populations in each traditional territory, their movement, and understand the behaviors exhibited by wolves in each community for the benefit of all. Ani, I'm Craig, a student at McMaster University. Today, approximately 10% of Ontario is designated as a provincial park or conservation reserve, each one having a unique goal or purpose based on the local environment. As part of the Conservation Through Reconciliation Partnership, and in response to calls for change in how land is protected in Canada, the goal of this project is to contribute toward modernizing existing government protected areas by learning about how they can better collaborate with local First Nations communities in the protection of these natural areas, with specific learning in the Minidugami region. Through conversations with First Nations community staff, community members, provincial government, and environmental organizations, I hope to learn about ways to improve alignment with community conservation initiatives, approaches for better engaging local Indigenous governance, and opportunities to strengthen relationships. I hope that what is learned through this project can help contribute toward improved regional coordination of environmental protection, key species protection, regional relationships, and the application of Indigenous conservation methods on park and conservation reserve lands. Research conversations are ongoing, and I hope to have some results to share soon. Miigwech for listening. The Eastern Massasauga Rattlesnake, Ontario's only venomous snake, is a threatened species in the Georgian Bay Biosphere of Minidogami. The Massasauga spends up to half its life overwintering in mossy wetlands called peatlands. The snakes return to the same peatland each year to overwinter underground, where it rarely drops below zero degrees Celsius or floods. 
Winter survival is crucial for populations to persist. Unfortunately, climate change can make winters more dangerous for snakes. Warmer winters lead to increased rainfall. This reduces snow depth and causes flooding. Snow acts as a blanket and insulates the moss mounds. Without enough snow, it may be too cold. Researchers in the McMaster Ecohydrology Lab are studying why certain peatland habitats are better at withstanding these changes. We've learned that the overwintering zone is most reduced when rain falls on snow, which adds water to the peatland from rainfall and snowmelt. So, taller moss mounds may provide a larger zone and be better at maintaining snake habitat despite climate changes. Peatland areas with trees often have taller moss mounds, which may help us identify good overwintering sites. This ongoing research will help us conserve overwintering habitat and even restore damaged habitat to protect these at-risk snakes. Humans are changing the Earth's climate, warming our winters and making severe storms and fires more frequent by burning fossil fuels that release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. In Canada, climate change has accelerated and temperatures have increased by about two degrees over the last 75 years. This is nearly double the global average. Mossy wetlands, such as peatlands, help counteract climate change by taking carbon out of the atmosphere and storing it in the ground as peat. Because peat decomposes very slowly when wet, it stores more carbon than pretty much any other ecosystem on Earth. Not only do peatlands offset climate change, they also provide habitat for at-risk species. But we don't know exactly how peatlands will be affected by climate change. Their ability to store carbon and provide habitat may be reduced as warming continues. Peatlands on Magnetowan First Nation lands are ideal for solving this mystery. Working with Magnetowan, researchers in the McMaster Ecohydrology Lab are studying how peatlands absorb and release energy, water, and carbon dioxide, and how these change over time. The peatlands we're monitoring at Magnetowan are part of a network of sites in the region and are gathering critical information on how peatlands are responding to climate change. Our hope, working alongside Magnetowan First Nation and their lands department, is to build capacity for community members to monitor climate change impacts and the health of their ecosystems. Okay, welcome back, everybody. So we're gonna get right back into our presentations. Hope everybody had a chance to grab a tea and a water and all that fresh air. Um, so we're gonna um, start back with Randy. Um, Randy Restool is the consultation coordinator in Stokies First Nation. Hello. Uh, Randy is the Community Consultation Coordinator in the Peace First Nation, and he's going to be giving a very interesting presentation on the repa repatriation project that Dokis is working on. Uh, so take it away, Randy. Hello and good morning. Uh, see if I have uh, the ability to share my screen. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Randy Restool. I'm the consultation coordinator here at Dokies First Nation. Uh, I've been here for about six years now uh, as consultation coordinator. Prior to that, uh, I was um, the economic development officer uh, for the community. So uh, throughout those years, um, I spent a lot of time doing fisheries uh, work, a lot of uh, environmental uh, work uh, related to forestry and as well uh, environmental assessments. Um, so through that, uh, I was able to gain um, quite a understanding and uh, knowledge uh, to uh, our, our land use. And uh, I'll speak on one of the projects that I've worked on uh, in relation to uh, remains uh, that were taken from, from the region. Uh, for those that are not familiar, uh, Bukis were a small community of 200 members, uh, and our community is on the uh, French River, uh, where Lake Nipsing ends and where the French River uh, begins. Uh, But our story goes to the time, uh, what is referred to uh, since time immemorial. Uh, the image on the left-hand side is a, is a pictograph uh, that is found uh, here uh, at the community along the French River at Cradle Rapids. Um, I don't know if you're able to see my cursor, but uh, it looks 
uh, a little image here uh, looks somewhat of a pine tree or it could be a, some kind of a, a measuring a, a meter. <laughs> it looks like a, a me measuring system. And on the right, uh, just um, beside that, uh, there's, a, there's a portion as well. And it's, it's been looks like it's been washed over in red, but it looks like an image of somebody upside down, a little stick figure upside down. So, and uh, that was only visible uh, by use of um, uh, digital um, imaging uh, using UV uh, filters. Um, the image on its own is not visible uh, with the naked eye. So, uh, there are. Uh, I, I could just imagine how many. Um, these pictographs are there that uh, we cannot even see today uh, without the use of digital technology. On the right hand side is um, what we have uh, along the river uh, here in Dokis, and, and Dokis, uh, the island, is called uh, Kikanda, and it refers to these rock pot formations uh, that are found along the uh, bedrock, uh, along the riverway. And uh, the image uh, in the photo on the right here is interesting because um, this location is currently uh, a small pond, a lake uh, that is not connected currently uh, to the French River. But it just shows historically that uh, the water levels were much higher, um, like going back to the time of the glaciers and when uh, these rocks were been formed at this site. Uh, here's another example of uh, pictographs in the region uh, going up towards uh, Lake Nipson and uh, uh, the pictographs are found at uh, Kennedy Island. And uh, this is an image of uh, a Wendigo uh, painting. Um, and uh, um, one of the local legends that I heard of the French River uh, refers to uh, the beaver people. Uh, at the French River. And there are historical uh, documents going to the 17th century, 18th century uh, on those early Jesuit um, reports and, and letters and correspondence and all. And it refers to uh, the beaver people of the French River. And uh, one of the legends uh, refers to uh, a Wendigo that was uh, preying upon uh, the, beaver, the beaver people the French River and um, was actually killed and uh, um, along the river and when it died it, it died inside of the river. I, I don't know of an exact location but it's one of the local uh, oral legends. Uh, Dokis, uh, Chief Dokis um, in, uh, signed the treaty in 1850 along with every other uh, Robinson here on uh, uh, community here and uh, just acknowledge all of uh, all of the relations and everyone and all of the regions that are represented here uh, today. Uh, this is a survey that was done uh, in 1853, one of the first uh, legal land surveys uh, of the region and uh, it just shows our proximity uh, between our neighboring communities of uh, Henvey, uh, First Nation, and Nipson as well, um, across the lake over there. So. <laughs> and uh, for Nikki's presentation, I, I wrote in the chat that uh, uh, there are uh, lake sturgeon that are found in Restoral Bay, uh, which is down by Sand Bay over here. Uh, little baby lake sturgeon, uh, first one I ever seen. Uh, I, I thought it was an alien. I, I didn't know what it was. So <laughs> that was my first experience with the uh, Specifically, uh, in terms of the repatriation, uh, the story goes back to uh, early 2000 when um, former chief Leonard Dukis was informed uh, by a tourist uh, from the US that there were remains being held at the uh, Chicago uh, Field Museum, and uh, the remains were taken uh, from this region. So that's basically all that we had uh, to start with, to go with. So over time, uh, we compiled uh, historical research 
then we were able to uh, narrow down uh, the entire story of, of the remains that were taken and uh, were held in Chicago. Uh, part of the story uh, goes back to uh, George Dawson, who was responsible for the Geological Survey of Canada. And uh, Dawson um, is well known for his work out in the uh, BC area, Dawson, Dawson Creek and all, and uh, Dawson Trail and, and all of that. Um, but uh, the survey uh, began in 1842, and uh, Dawson was appointed in 1875. In 1877, uh, the project was expanded to include all specimens and materials for the Canadian Museum of Natural History. All materials became the property of the government, and um, a lot of the work uh, in relation to uh, the collection of skulls uh, was, uh, was used uh, to support uh, uh, Darwin's theory of evolution. Uh, Dawson worked mainly with the uh, Haida, uh, communities and found them uh, to be more advanced uh, than other nations along the West Coast. Um, uh, and then uh, Franz Boas uh, was an individual. Uh, his first work um, was under uh, George Dawson. Uh, Franz, um, Franz Boas uh, first worked in the Arctic, sorry. Uh, with the Inuit uh, up at Baffin Island. And uh, his early collections of uh, remains and artifacts were sent uh, to museums in Berlin. And then uh, Boaz, uh, his personal collection of skulls began in 1883. And uh, um, then began working under Dawson in 1887. Uh, Franz Boaz, uh, as an anthropologist, um, is well known for his uh, studies of uh, language, customs, and ceremony, primarily on the West Coast. Uh, Franz Boas became involved uh, with the Columbian Exposition, uh, which was held in 1893 in Chicago, uh, and this was to celebrate the 400th anniversary of uh, Columbus discovering America. Of course, uh, we know we were always here, but uh, um, but that's what they recognize anyway. <laughs> uh, Boaz uh, was hired to work under uh, Putnam, and, uh, who is another uh, an anthropologist uh, well-known in the States. Uh, um, and part of um, the exposition was uh, his collection of skulls were put on display within the anthropo uh, anthro <laughs> uh, within one of the uh, um, displays uh, at the World's Fair. And um, even participants of the World's Fair, uh, there were uh, measurements were taken of uh, participants that volunteered during that time and was all uh, in relation to that was all in relation uh, to um, the, the classification of man and, and the science of the time. Uh, Boaz did write and received uh, permission from the Department of Indian Affairs uh, to collect the measurements uh, of Indians for the Dominion of Canada. But as for the actual collection itself, uh, this is an example of one of the, the uh, catalog cards. Um, this is the only information that is currently available within the um, Chicago Museum. Uh, on the left-hand side is the uh, catalog number and uh, a description of the location, um, the sex, the collection, which is the Boaz Hall uh, collection. Thomas Proctor Hall was an agent working for Boaz in this region. And uh, this catalog card describes uh, the remains of a, a young female um, based on the, um, how the uh, molars were, uh, the teeth were formed in the molars. Uh, uh, the, Germans uh, email. Uh, interesting through the um, research as well, uh, Reverend Wilson, who um, began, uh, who started the uh, Shingwok School, uh, residential school, was instructed by Thomas Proctor Hall, uh, an agent of Boaz, uh, to take measurements and hair samples as well 
uh, of the students uh, of the schools. And in Wilson's own autobiography, uh, he writes that, uh, quote, uh, we could only induce four Indians to submit to measurements. It seemed to offend their dignity, and they did not understand what it was for. Uh, it just goes to show um, the lack of uh, ethics uh, in, in relation to the, the taking of uh, measurements in, in this work uh, by the scientific uh, community uh, at this time. Uh, the repatriation process, um, as I mentioned, we had to conduct all of the historical research, uh, forming partnerships. Um, uh, Dokis is um, operating on behalf of all of the communities uh, within the Robinson Huron Treaty area. And uh, we do have uh, written uh, support for the project. And as well, um, we have uh, a written letter of support from the Algonquin community. And there was no, uh, no recognition uh, by the regional uh, chief. Uh, to me, this identifies uh, a need for um, a policy uh, in regards to uh, who uh, should have some signing authority on um, repatriation processes in the future. Uh, requested, uh, uh, the museum requested that we gain the uh, support of American tribes, but uh, that's where we drew the line. Um, um, we did not see that uh, there was any American interest or uh, jurisdiction over our re uh, the repatriation of our own uh, members uh, from our region, uh, just as similar as we were not involved with repatriation efforts for communities in the U.S. The Field Museum uh, Board approved the repatriation to the Okis in 2019, and then COVID happened. <laughs> uh, we had intended to um, conduct a community uh, consultation, so the intent of uh, today's presentation was to uh, raise awareness of the project and um, basically just um, share that information. Um, the remains have been repatriated and uh, turned over to Dokis back in November. And uh, this is a photograph of uh, Chief Dokis uh, at the Field Museum during the ceremony. And uh, we do intend to uh, have the remains buried uh, at Dead Island in Georgian Bay, uh, hopefully uh, on Aboriginal Day this summer. But, uh, stay tuned for more information and uh, I'll be sharing links online and. Uh, uh, we're working on an article as well with the uh, initial on big news. So um, that's, that's it for now. Thank you. Miigwech, Randy. That is such an interesting presentation. Um, the project itself is just unbelievable, really. Yeah, so thank you so much for sharing. Um, I didn't notice any questions. Um, one question that you had is Tony in Cuba. No, no. <laughs> he's, he's here. He was, hey. Um, but that's a great prelude to our next pres presenters, actually. Um, thank you again, Randy. Um, also, if anybody has any questions for Randy, we'll put those in the Q&A and we will get to those when we can. You guys can hear me all okay? My audio's back up and working, all right. Um, so our next presenters are Sarah, and Anthony from Wanapate First Nation. Uh, Sarah Lehman, sorry if I'm not pronouncing that properly, is the environmental coordinator at Wanapate First Nation. Um, she has over five years of resource management experience. She's led many field programs, um, including provincial fisheries assessments and water quality monitoring. Um, Presenting with her, I believe, otherwise uh, Sarah will let you know, is Anthony LaForge. Anthony is the lands director at Wanapate First Nation. He is a member of Nipissing First Nation who has over 30 years experience in First Nation governance. Um, before his time at Wanapate, he was our fearless leader here in Magdadawan. He was our lands manager. He worked here for 10 years, and he was the one who initiated our Species at Risk program. Uh, you can read more about him in his bio. Um, but take it away, Sarah. 
Thank you so much for that great introduction. Um, I am getting over a cold, so pardon me if my voice gets a little raspy at any point, so I'm going to do my best to get through this. Um, Anthony is in and out. Um, he's got quite a busy day today, so hopefully he'll be able to jump on and say a few things, and I'm sure he'll just jump in whenever if he's around. So um, without further ado, I'll get started. Uh, I think I'm assuming, and maybe that's wrong of me, but um, Wanapate, as most of you know, is in an area that's got a lot of mining and resource extraction activity. Um, it's within the Sudbury Basin and the traditional territory of Wanapate really encompasses a lot of that area. So hopefully today we can show you and also learn from you um, a bit about what we do and what works for us. And like I said, uh, in the coming days, we'll be able to start that conversation and, and learn more from each other. So to start off, I just like to go over our team. Uh, so as Sam had said, Anthony is our lands director. He's been awesome. I'm relatively new to this role. Um, it was actually just a year uh, in February. So that's pretty exciting for me. I've been learning a ton and I'm hoping that I've been teaching a lot or been able to bring what I know to the community and it's been helpful. Um, as you can see, so I'm the environmental coordinator. Um, my counterpart is Glenn, the resource management coordinator. He deals with a lot of um, the mining agreements and a lot of those bigger agreements with Anthony. Um, but below us, or not below us, but with us is our technicians. Um, they're all amazing, and I don't know where we would be without them. We've got a really great GIS and mapping technologist uh, that is just great. He's been helping a lot. Um, as you can see, our lead environmental tech uh, is currently vacant, so we've unfortunately lost our lead tech. So we're, that is uh, been posted and we'll continue to be posting that. Um, so if anyone is looking for a job, please feel free to reach out. We also have a general environmental tech and then uh, we have a waste diversion team. So Paul Reckle and Paul uh, McDonald who just keep our community running, which is amazing. We really do have such a great team and, and I can just see the foundation for where we want to go in the next couple of years. So to start out, here's a map of um, Wanapate and the watershed. The areas you can see, the upper Wanapate and lower Wanapate, are all what we consider the traditional territory. Um, Wanapate First Nation originally used to use all the way from the French River up along the Wanapate River system as um, traditional territory, and it's very important for us to manage this area. Unfortunately, uh, there is a lot of mining, so in the area just very close to the community, we have Podolsky Mine and Whistle Mine. Um, Whistle Mine is actually inactive, so it's now in remediation. And then we have Podolsky Mine, which has just started doing a little bit of work. Um, again, it was inactive. And then a little bit further south, we have uh, Glencore Mining uh, near the airport. So. This is just one of the ways that our traditional territory is being impacted. Uh, one of the other main ways is we have a lot of um, Ontario power generation damming along the Wanapate River system. So you can just get a quick idea of all of the different resource impacts that the community and the territory is experiencing. So we're trying really hard to be great stewards of the land and make sure that all this work is being done um, in the best way possible. So to preface that, um, it's important for Wanabate. And even before I started, one of the first things I did was I went to the, their website and they, the community, I am so grateful for, um, they, they really value the natural environment and given the amount of resource extraction and, um, land, uh, land changes that are happening, it's so important that we have this type of um, this, this pressure that's there and then that we're taking responsibility. So um, this is actually directly from the website and it just shows that people in the natural environment are so important to Wanapate First Nation. And, and as part of my job is to really capture that and make sure that we're doing the best we can to protect Wanapate and the people. Um, I also think it's important that 
It shows we have a strong sense of identity and community pride. We are a very young community. So um, in terms of the amount of people we have and the work that's been done, I think there's so much more opportunities. And I think that hopefully, um, I know Anthony has made kind of this amazing headway and shown um, and led different communities and to the success that they've seen. So hopefully we'll be able to, to start down that path as well and really start making some great changes. With all of these mining um, and resource extraction that are happening in our area, we have opportunities for large scale contracts and um, Glenn might join us um, in the next day, but for now I'll kind of talk on part of what he really works on, which is all of these large scale contracts. Hello, Hello Tony. Hello. <laughs> There's Anthony. Are you there? I think he was on the phone or yes, answering a phone I call. Am, so I was just on the phone, but yes, I'm here. Carry on. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Lana. Um, okay. So, yeah, um, we have a we try our best to include the youth and community in all of these contracts. So, these contracts for us are an opportunity to make ourselves heard, make sure that we're protecting the environment. And, and one of, like I said, one of those big, big cornerstone ideas is the youth and community. We also try and make environmental responsibility the forefront of these contracts. We really want to make sure that the these contracts, these businesses, they're doing everything they can um, to promote environmental sustainability. Um, some other things that we try to include are capacity building. So how can we grow as a community and um, a department to make sure that we can continue to do the most in these contracts? Um, education and protection is also another big pillar of what we try and include in these contracts, as well as resource sharing and employment. Um, these are some of the things that we always keep in mind um, when we go into contracts or any contract renewal to make sure that we're always trying to better all of these different pillars. One of the things that we've really benefited from is from those big contracts is having smaller contracts that are really service agreements. This helps us stay involved with the projects and really gives us an opportunity and the community an opportunity to be involved. Um, so some of the things that we've done that have worked well include water sampling. Um, so our technicians go out to most of the mines in our area and do a lot of their baseline water sampling, which gives us access to that data. Um, and also gives us those regular meetings to check in with the, the businesses and, and the companies to make sure that everything is going well. Um, we also have project management. So based on our team skills, we'll be able to help manage and consult uh, with those different groups. We try to encourage environmental management contracts. So where possible, we'll be able to go in and help monitor. We also have summer employment contracts, which we're still kind of working out the best way to do these. Currently, how it works is the company will come to us and say, we would like to have a technician over the summer. So we want to pay for station, we'll hire someone um, and they'll work through us. So that way we have a lot of the, um, the benefit of having the access to the community members. If there's any young people or summer students who are looking for jobs, um, we can access that, that group of people um, and also give people the opportunity to work while helping us um, find people to join our team as well. We've also started having these subcontractor consulting instances where um, bigger companies will have a project that a con consultant, sorry, will come on and they'll actually work with us to hire our technicians or work with them, which has been really helpful. So overall, some of the things we've learned is be confident um, in these contracts and in these agreements. So it's important for us to know what kind of skills we have and what they're worth in um, in some of the more mainstream job uh, and the business environment, uh, we always try and ask for more. So having strong goals in mind is really helpful when we do that, making sure that we're constantly improving our presence and what we can, um, what we can add. Something that Alana said is that two-eyed seeing. So a lot of the time when we start projects, it's a lot of Western science. So adding that community um, input and, and knowledge transfer is important to us. 
Um, also understanding the work. So in order to have a really meaningful contract, you need to know exactly what's being done. So whether that's having some meetings um, before you get started or just really sitting down at that table and spending time to understand what you want out of the contract is important. Also building relationships. So we've had consulting companies now who are familiar with the work and, and know that we do good work come to us before a company even says they're doing a project and asks if they can work with us, which we've in the past have really enjoyed because it gives us an opportunity to work with the consultant and really build that relationship instead of building it into a request for proposal from the company. Uh, the other thing that we've really found important is to express concerns. Sometimes it feels like uh, maybe we don't know something and the dean made a good point and a quote on this. And it, it, even if you don't understand something or it's, it's a place where you don't have all that knowledge, it's a perfect opportunity to either get clarification or maybe figure out that that's a good opportunity to fix something. So some of the things that I'm hoping as a environmental coordinator to start building up into our lands department and into our future work is, like I said, it's it's already in the initial stages, but really building up that subconsulting work. So having those agreements, those service agreements with these contractors and, and being able to work through projects with them instead of having companies come to us and say, oh, we want some representation, so we're going to work this into the service agreement. Um, we'd also like to start standardizing First Nation participation and representation. So each time we work with a new company or a new opportunity, we build that into our agreement. So having a really strong agreement at the start is going to help us going forward. We'd also like to continue to build our capacity and create a role for full-time workers on job sites. Um, I can see a really strong need for Indigenous knowledge holders um, ensuring work is done in a good way. Um, that's something that we're working on. Glenn and I are trying to work together. And I think that this is going to be more so beneficial for a lot of First Nations as these types of agreements and contracts come up. So hopefully we'll be able to, to really bring this to fruition in the next couple of years. We also want to create longevity and capacity building among the technical staff. So um, even though I haven't worked here for very long, I've already been able to see that there is a high turnover. So that's one thing that I'd like to try and reduce, um, really have staff join us and stay for a while. Um, and then lastly, I want to continue to build our community involvement, encourage engagement. Um, right now, we really are struggling to get a strong community engagement. And I think one of the problems is we've just had a lot of staff turnover, so there hasn't been any consistency. So going forward, this is one thing that um, I think we can really build on and, and looking at other communities and especially um, Magnetowan, how they work with the community. It's, it's really admirable. So we're going to work towards that as well. Some of the things we do within the community uh, include some community-based monitoring. So lake water, timber and aggregate information and lands assessments. We also have resource management. So uh, we try and stay on top of feasibility studies um, and improvement projects. And lastly, we have grants and funding programs. So as a lot of others, we rely heavily on funding to do a lot of the work we're doing. So species at risk monitoring, environmental monitoring. These are all things that I'd like to build on as we go forward. So to conclude, um, agreements and contracts help to start a conversation. So as much as sometimes I look back at some of the agreements we've done and think there's ways that we could have improved them, um, there's also a lot to be said for the contracts and agreements we've done. And even if there, you see those contracts as being either problematic or maybe not the best, it's, it's an opportunity to learn. Um, we've also learned that clear goals and outcomes are helpful for all of our projects. Um, we're still learning a lot and always trying to do better. Um, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. <clears throat> and then lastly, just knowing that how important the community aspect to all of our work is, um, I'm really looking forward to being able to improve that aspect of, of what we do. Thank you so much, everybody. Right on, Sarah. Excellent job. Can everybody hear me? Can anybody hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, all right. Well, uh, Annie, hello and bonjour tout le monde. That's for Randy there. That I was fine. 
Um, thank you. That was great, Sarah. Uh, pleasure to be here. Thank you, one of, uh, thank you, Magneto on ladies and gentlemen over there. Thank you for inviting us. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, Sarah went through everything that, uh, that we wanted to express today. Uh, but I want to give a shout out to all the former staff that uh, I worked at one of the team. All the Recollect tribe there, Stephanie, Cheryl, Peter, and Nikki, and, and the rest that worked there. They set the groundwork for us, for what we have there now. Uh, we didn't, we're not inventing anything over there. We had a good groundwork crew and uh, understanding with the mining companies and what Wanapete does. So it was easy for us to hit the ground running over there. Um, uh, with regards to our environmental, with, uh, which, which Sarah was mentioning, we do want to get into drone monitoring as well, our shoreline, our border, because well, we're also going into a land code. We're developmental in a land code right now. So we're doing a lot of, uh, we're doing surveys this summer, our border, our land survey of the First Nation. Um, we're doing an ESA. That's all part of the individual agreement as we move forward with the land code. So we have that going as well, okay, with, with all the plethora of other things we're going. But drone monitoring, I want to look at uh, you know, our, our shoreline. We've got deals with OPG as well, restoration of the shoreline this year. So we have some responsibilities there with lake levels. And, uh, and I do want to look for, uh, you know, invasive species, species at risk or anything else like that. And I was talking to Sarah about doing some Sasquatch monitoring. Just kidding. So that'd be a good presentation. Um, but, you know, the groundwork I was talking about that was set with our, with our service contracts, we have, we have um, you know, we're, we're ground zero of mining in the world, right? In Sudbury, in the Sudbury Basin. Uh, we have agreements with uh, Valet, Glencore, our, our major ones, for me, Falcon Bridge and Inco. We deal with them hugely right now. We're doing an agreement with Glencore right now, but what we're, the groundwork that was set and what we're moving forward with now is setting the stage for a brand new mine that's happening. Nicarim South over the Victor mine. Nicarim South is right at, that's the, the famous mine there, Falcon Bridge, and that's what's going to really go into care and maintenance, so they're going to end the production. But Valley and Glencore have hated each other so long they can't even work together on the new mine because the new mine is actually started for it's going to be started on Glencore's property and go over to Valet. So they get a third party entity coming at us for the new, new, new agreement. So this is where we can get them on an impact benefit agreement and something huge, something really good for the community. Because the other ones we have their existing contracts, we got to leave them as, as is till they run out, but we're negotiating for better for better compensation and better environmental. We're doing that right now. But this new joint venture is going to be a 25 to 40 year deposit. So, but it's the first time Valley and Glencore work together. They're going to work together. So we get the opportunity with everything we set in stage right now with our service contracts, we're going to get a big piece of the pie, you know, when it comes to, uh, in, uh, to our contracts and uh, our agreements and our impact benefit agreements. So I just want to say that, that everything we've done has been done. It's going to lead up to this, this new agreement, brand new, and we can actually go with our indigenous rights and everything else because it's a new agreement as opposed to the other ones who are old ones and under the Indian Act too as well. So being under the land code will really help us give us some more leverage. So that's what we're trying to get to. Uh, Anthony, yeah. um, we have a question I just realized. Um, so the person is asking if there's going to be an opportunity to engage the whole community, so want to take for station as a whole community on the new service agreements, and what kind of new agreements has want to negotiated with industry in the past two years? Yes, to the first question, and um, pretty well the same that we have before. Um, but we're getting we're we're trying to be subcontractors in uh, some aquatic aquatic uh, uh, projects we have. Uh, we're we're looking at three year AFSAR right now as well. So that's going to be, you know, so we're looking at species of risk. We're looking at more contracts. Well, the list of contracts are basically, we moved on with some. We've got a lot of MOUs. We're looking at exploration agreements now with the drilling companies. Um, all those new drilling companies, we're actually getting them to sign up for an MOU or depending on if they ever find something, then we can get that we got them on the hook for an agreement. So we're doing a lot of that mining exploration drilling kind of contracts. Uh, but environmental contracts, we, we're, we're, trying, we're participating in, in some of their studies. So those are probably some of the ones you're talking about or that was asked. So that's about the best I can answer. Hope that works. Yeah, not, make which, yeah. Make which for, for taking over the, the Q&A section there. 
Sorry, I just figured that maybe I could get Anthony on that just because I really did know the answer to it. Perfect. You just take, you just take it over a job there. Um, <laughs> the, the, la, lastly, um, yeah, like I mentioned the land code, but um, yeah, so it's uh, any other questions, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I know we're running on time, so thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Sarah and Anthony, for presenting um, and for letting us know what's going on over there at Wanda Tay. Um, Next, on our list of presenters, actually, uh, in regards to questions, we will put those in the Q&A, of course, if anybody has them. And if we can't get to a, another question period for all of our presenters today, uh, we will be having, um, tomorrow, we'll be having a, a more uh, fun time to be able to answer questions and, and meet together. And yeah, that's tomorrow. So. Um, our next presenter is Thomas Asinoe. He is the Natural Resource Coordinator at Atikmishing First Nation. Um, so prior to his work at Atikmishing, he had managed a variety of projects, including environmental site assessment, monitoring, remediation, and more. Um, so miigwech for being here, Thomas, and go, ahead, go on ahead. Miigwech for having me. and. Um... Uh, Annie, bonjour, uh, bonjour everyone. Uh, it's a really honor to be speaking to all of you here this morning. And uh, I know we're short on time, so I won't uh, take up uh, too much of uh, everyone's time before lunch. I know everyone's getting a little hungry. Um, you can see my shared screen properly. Yep, that looks perfect. Okay. Okay. So Tech Machine's uh, history, uh, our first, the First Nation is located about uh, 19 kilometers west of uh, uh, Sudbury. Uh, we're just under 44,000 uh, acres of land. We have numerous lakes, uh, interior and uh, within its boundaries. As of uh, April 2019, we've had uh, just over 13,000, uh, 1300 members, community members. And the community has a fully functioning band governing system, including a lands and resource department, along with our own land code. A tech machine has developed and delivered uh, ver various uh, environmental and natural resource programs, such as uh, species at risk. Uh, moving forward, you'll see species at risk, uh, just abbreviated to SAR. So part of our uh, species at risk programs, we've developed our um, a species at risk uh, management plan. This management plan, we utilize uh, government funding opportunities as well as in-kind funding. Typically, we'll start with approved funding. And once the project is finished, if we cannot secure additional funds, if the community enjoys and appreciates the project and if they see a benefit for, for everyone, we will continue uh, programs with the equipment that we've already purchased with uh, the approved funding. For Tech Machine, we in our uh, draft uh, SAR management uh, plan, we've identified all this list of uh, uh, species that uh, either we've observed ourselves or just identified in uh, mapping exercises and stuff like that. So you can see we've classified uh, different species into categories as birds, fish, insects, mammals, etc. And then we have the classifications of the, the Canada status and the Ontario status as well for each of those. Some of our funding opportunities, uh, as mentioned in uh, some of uh, the previous uh, uh, presenters, we have uh, SARSP, the uh, AFSAR, CORDA, ICCE, uh, Indigenous Community Based Climate Monitoring Program, and CCHAP, uh, Climate Change and Health Ad Adaptation Program. Uh, with some of these programs and our uh, past programs, we've uh, utilized the funding for AFSAR and our aquatic uh, program. We studied some uh, sturgeon spawning in some of the uh, impounded sections of the Vermilion and Spanish rivers. We know this uh, isolated uh, populations are different from the main Spanish river that uh, leads out to uh, Lake Huron and uh, Georgian Bay. Um, Another project we have have on that's ongoing is we've had phase one, two, and three of Species at Risk Bat Project. And uh, 
The one I'll be focusing on on this presentation will be our species at risk uh, turtle project. And other quarter projects we had was uh, fishing and invasive species uh, skill training. We had youth and elders go out together and do some fishing and look for invasive species and teaching the youth um, about uh, those incentives. And uh, recently we just uh, purchased a micro hatchery uh, to update our community center, youth center program and our lands department to purchase all new equipment uh, for the micro hatchery. And in the past, 2019 CCHAP, we had a moose project uh, very similar to uh, Magnetowan's um, uh, wildlife program that uh, was mentioned previously. So our turtle project uh, was based on previous funding we had in 2017 and 18. It initiated uh, species at risk uh, reptile monitoring program, which didn't focus specifically on turtles, but uh, reptiles in general. And we had great feedback uh, from the community and this led to the creation of our uh, uh, species at risk management plan, which is currently in use and uh, used with land uh, use planning within our community of uh, certain key developments and uh, infrastructure. Uh, in the past, we've utilized nonprofit organizations to raise and hatch our turtle eggs. Uh, given the community support, we're hoping to continue this great work and continue building our capacity for, to protect uh, species at risk turtles and raising our own eggs and hatch and release them back into the wild within the First Nation. So the two uh, species that we focused on are the Blanding's turtle. Uh, they're classified as threatened and the snapping turtle is uh, classified as a special concern. And you can see in the photo here that I took uh, last year, uh, <clears throat> this snapping turtle must've got hit by a vehicle of some sorts and has a cracked shell right down uh, the back, but otherwise uh, seems healthy. So a brief uh, summary of our project is uh, roads are a major threat to turtle populations. Mitigative uh, strategies must be well informed to ensure their effect effectiveness. Our project uses an innovative approach to incorporate stewardship, community monitoring, TEK, and Western science to develop best management practices for mitigation strategies to enhance snapping or blending turtles recovery for tick machine. And here's some pictures you can see turtles that have uh, gone too far into the roadway that uh, potentially might get hit or run over or um, potentially for doing uh, <coughs> road maintenance, a grader can just come in and wipe the, the nests right out. So our approach for this project was, it's been determined uh, for the past few years with previous funding and community uh, monitoring. Uh, survival nests are very uh, low here in the Tikmiching and we've collected enough evidence to suggest that uh, the populations are declining. So, we're testing mitigative strategies and try to help uh, uh, the survival rate of uh, these species at risk turtles and uh, the recovery of them. So our three main objectives to achieve this is evaluating effectiveness of road signs as a mitigation strategy to reduce road mortality. So bringing awareness to drivers on the road that you're in a highly uh, populated uh, uh, turtle crossing area. Uh, and then eva Eval number two, evaluating the effectiveness of nest caging and artificial incubation to promote uh, SAR turtle nesting success. And third is to have the community engagement and stewardship. So part of our program, we installed these signs on roadways that are known to have turtle crossings in the area to bring an awareness to drivers, uh, especially in the springtime when they're crossing to create the nests. And one of the other programs we I'll talk about in a bit is uh, we get the community involved. So we had a community uh, contest to create uh, signs, one for youth and one for um, adults uh, to bring some self-awareness uh, for the community and take some pride in uh, bringing awareness to uh, uh, these turtle crossings and it takes some ownership from the community. They, I know I say this because uh, most of our signs get shot in the fall time when it's uh, hunting season and we kind of lose uh, 
uh, the effectiveness of the signs and people just use them as target practice. But we find if a community member has developed and created these signs, they tend to leave them alone a little bit less and uh, disturb them uh, a little bit less. So evalu evaluating the effectiveness of road signs as a mitigation strategy to reduce road mortalities is a practice widely used but rarely tested. We look to build upon our previous work where we put up turtle crossing signs in areas that was a combination of heavy ve vehicle traffic and observations of uh, turtles crossing the road. Our methods to test this is we have three different types of signs, one in English, one in Ojibwe, and then, as I mentioned before, a community member or a local artist developed the, the signs. We evaluate the effectiveness of these signs and daily road surveys to document uh, turtle road mortalities observed before and after sign development. This information will then be uh, analyzed and shared with other communities to ensure best management practices while using these mitigative uh, signages. Uh, so some of the nests that uh, venture too far into the road, we will excavate them as they uh, potentially could get destroyed. So you can see uh, my colleague here, Shannon Gonamwebe and myself uh, doing some excavations um, with the help of uh, Magnetowan. So evaluating the effectiveness of uh, nest caging and artificial incubation to promote uh, turtle success. So while we're conducting these surveys in mid-June and mid-July at dawn and dusk to locate these uh, nesting sites, one third will re receive a flag to mark them but not be protected. And uh, another third will be protected with uh, uh, turtle cages, will protect them from predation but not from all the elements. And then finally, we'll excavate and collect the remaining nests for artificial incubation. So we purchased some incubators with herb staps and we'll put the eggs in the, the incubators and grow them ourselves and then release them once they're hatched and successfully uh, uh, hatched. Uh, we'll evaluate all nests in all at risk locations, such as the middle of a roadway, or if we know there's gonna be construction in an area, we'll just excavate the nests and all these uh, high, uh, highly uh, uh, trafficked areas. Uh, eggs will be checked once a week to make sure they're doing well. And when the eggs start hatching in mid-August, we will release them shortly after. So you can see our, uh, our first strategy of, or second strategy of just putting uh, nests on the road. You can see they're not too far onto the road where they might get disturbed or damaged or destroyed. So we can protect them a little bit from foxes. And so you can see the next uh, unsuccessful caging, uh, either foxes, raccoons, birds, bears have got into the nest. You can see the eggs distributed on the ground here. Uh, hopefully some survive, but. And here's a picture of our uh, incubators and herb stats in our lands department with uh, the one on the right has some eggs uh, in it from our first uh, excavation. So with this program and this funding, we've developed some partnerships and Magnetowan was a key uh, partner for us as uh, we're new to this um, program and not a lot of experience. So we, we had uh, Corey, a former employee from Magnetowan, we reached out to her to see if they could provide us with some assistance and they happily uh, said yes. So Lana and uh, Nadine, um, has assisted us from day one. Nadine even came up to the First Nation Spring to help train and assist us with uh, nest excavations so that we're not destroying and causing too much damage to the eggs and to uh, transport egg incubation, egg incubation, proper handling techniques and releasing methods and stuff like that. So they were a great help to us. We also used uh, other um, par partnerships with uh, Turtle Pond Wildlife Center, they provided us with the same assistance. And we had a PhD student, uh, Damien Mullen um, from the University of uh, New Brunswick. He was a uh, next colleague of ours uh, a few years ago, and he was um, really knowledgeable about the species at risk uh, reptiles. So he got the ball going for this uh, program for us and uh, we're just continuing it on. So I got a quick video here. I tried not to disturb this uh, snapping turtle too much, but you can see 
I placed the cage the, the night before on another nest and he came up the next morning or she came up the next morning and wanted to, to lay some eggs and build a nest right beside the, the cage. So because of uh, the location of this nest was right on the grader's edge, we figured we should excavate this uh, nest uh, in case it gets destroyed. So we can help, uh, help that uh, female out. So some of the results we had uh, with Nadine coming up, as mentioned, we excavated two nests, collected a total of 78 uh, snapping turtle eggs. Out of uh, the 78, eight, 78 eggs, 47 of them hatched and were released back into the wild. And to our knowledge, there were no reported injuries or killed turtles on the roadways within a tick machine. I know I had that picture from the, the turtle at the beginning of the, of the presentation. We don't know when that one happened, but it that was reported to us that that one turtle has been injured for several years now and has uh, has just survived with the crack in the back. And so we we've just left them alone, and uh, hopefully he'll keep uh, she'll keep uh, keep healthy. So we have a picture on uh, the bottom right of our uh, community uh, release. We get uh, try to get as many youth involved so that uh, they could help and preserve uh, species at risk for future generations. And here are some pictures of our community release. Uh, normally these events are bigger for us, but due to COVID, we had to limit the amount of people and uh, social distancing and stuff like that. So uh, hopefully we will ramp it up next year and have uh, a better turnout and some more eggs. Here's a quick picture of our setup of our, uh, incubate, our, our uh, baby turtles once they've hatched. Cute little guys, and man, do they ever love to eat. So our future plans, uh, we are looking to continue and apply for additional funding for the, our turtle program. If we are unsuccessful, uh, as I mentioned before, we look to continue this program even with our in-kind funding and use the equipment we've already purchased uh, through the funding sources. Uh, we are still learning, we're gaining experience. Uh, last turtle season, we only utilized about 25% of the room in the incubators. So this upcoming season, we hope to ramp up our production by using 100% of the room in both incubators. We plan to excavate all turtle nests, regardless if it's on the road or uh, off the road, uh, just to help keep uh, bring up the survival rate of these nests as we see predation is a pretty uh, heavily, uh, dis uh, they destroy a lot of the nests basically. And we don't see a lot of nests surviving uh, even to uh, the fall. Um, and then with our, another funding source that we currently have, uh, we are at the moment, we do have a species of coordinator job posting open. I think it's up until uh, mid March. So if anyone's interested, it's a one-year project and they will assist with our bat project that we currently have going on and uh, future turtle projects and any other species at risk projects, um, looking for additional funding sources and field work and stuff like that. So you can see here, one morning we were successful. We had two females laying their eggs. Once they were completed, we put uh, turtle cages on them to help the survival rate of those uh, eggs. And going out every day, we observed that these nests were un undisturbed. So hopefully they survived. And that's Miigwech for everything. And thank you for listening to my presentation. Good, Thomas. That was awesome. Good job that you guys are doing over there. Your incubation look room looks just like ours. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, thank you everybody, all of our speakers, thank you. Um, I just wanted to remind everybody that like our, if there was questions that weren't answered, like I said, we'll do that in, in the breakout period tomorrow. Um, all right, Miigwech everybody, have a great lunch. Welcome back, everybody. You can hear me okay? Okay. Um, we hope that all your bellies are full and 
that you're excited to hear our keynote speaker. Um, we are very fortunate to be joined today by Amber Sandy, who will be talking about Indigenous knowledge and science. Um, Amber is a, a member of Neoshingaming. Did I say that properly? <laughs> um, she's an artist with a focus on leatherwork, beadwork, and tufting. Amber is a high tanner who uh, uses moose, deer, and fish skins to make leather by hand. As a coordinator of Indigenous Knowledge and Science Outreach for the Sci Exchange at X University, she is an enthusiastic advocate for Indigenous science. Her work focuses on the intersections of indigenous knowledge and Western science and her approach to conservation, environmental science, education, and art. She passionately works to increase uh, access to traditional land-based practices for indigenous people. Thank you so much, Amber, for being here with us today. Um, you are welcome to, to share your screen. Awesome, thank you so much. Okay, to share my screen and get this going. Um, Ani, Amber Nindishnikas, Makwan, Dodam, Neashinining Ming, Nidotiba. Hello, my name is Amber. <clears throat> I'm from Neashinining Ming, which I'll talk a little bit about after, but uh, it is such an honor to be here with everybody. Um, I only wish we were in person, although I do get less nervous talking over Zoom because I can't see everybody in person. Um, it's so special to come to this conference every year and be around peers and people that I've had the honor of getting to know and build relationships with over the past few years. Um, and so exciting for me the Magnetowan Lands Department for celebrating 10 years of this incredible work that you've taken on um, monitoring your species at risk in the community. It's really incredible. And um, I can remember the first Magnetowan uh, lands conference and how much things have changed has been really inspiring and seeing more communities come and get involved and share all of their work is really, really special. So I'm really honored to be here today. Um, I wanna share a little bit about my journey of how I got to where I am today um, and focus a little bit of talking about one of my favorite topics, which is hide tanning, which I could talk about for days. So um, yeah, so I currently work for X University, which is previously known as Ryerson University. We are working on a name change that will hopefully happen this year. Um, I work in the Faculty of Sciences Outreach Office, which is called SciExchange, and um, I'm the Indigenous Knowledge and Science Outreach Coordinator. And I'm not a scientist by training. Um, I do consider myself a natural scientist because of all the work I've had the pleasure of doing. And, um, but I actually studied um, Canadian history and Indigenous studies. So like many other Indigenous people, I really struggled as a youth. Um, I dropped out of high school at a really young, early age. And I really just couldn't see myself in that space or in those positions. And it wasn't until I was probably in my early 20s that I decided that I wanted to pursue um, my education. And I applied to a bridging program at the University of Toronto after I went and studied hard and wrote my GED. And uh, this program allowed me to take a couple courses, learn how to write um, university level essays. And uh, when you pass, you get accepted into university. So. Um, that's what started me and one of the courses I chose to take in that program was Canadian history and it was the first time I had ever learned some pre-colonial history um, outside of the public school system which really doesn't do us justice and I was enamored by it I just started to see the world differently around me and started to understand how much um, deep and rich and meaningful history we as Anishinaabe people have on this land. And I became really passionate about sharing that. So over the next few years, I've worked, uh, I've primarily worked and lived in Toronto for about 15 years. Um, and I started by working at the Native Canadian Centre of Toronto, uh, creating an app called First Story Toronto, which documented the Indigenous history around the city. And from there, I did a few other community-based projects 
until I landed a position at the Toronto Zoo as the uh, coordinator of their Turtle Island Conservation Program. And um, I applied for that job knowing that, you know, I had some community work behind me and I was ready to take on a new challenge. And I was really thrown into it. So I had to, my first year there, write my first AFSAR grant to continue uh, funding our program which was a huge <laughs> undertaking for someone who had only previously written like historical or arts grants. And I found myself uh, learning everything I possibly could about Ontario's reptile and amphibians um, with a focus on turtles. And I loved it. Um, I remember my first few months in the position, I got to travel around to our partner communities that we had at the time and uh, meet some of the lovely people that are here today. Um, and I was so gung-ho and eager in that position to go in with our Toronto Zoo turtle models and um, go share everything I had learned about turtles. Um, and I quickly learned and realized that it wasn't really my place to come into any community and teach, um, teach that knowledge because I would go in ready to go off my spiel and really learn that like communities, youth, all of the people we were engaging with have such valuable um, intrinsic knowledge that of the, these species we're talking about because they live with them and they have lived with them um, in, our, in our communities since forever. Um, so that was a real eye opener for me uh, and the first time I, I kind of realized like, oh, wow, I should be approaching this work in a different way. And uh, it's kind of what spurred me into what I do today. And I'm very, very passionate about, about sharing how our knowledges are scientific and our stories are scientific. And um, just by virtue of living on the land and so close to the land, we have relationships that are quite different than non-Indigenous people do uh, with the land and the beings that live on that land. So um, for me, I really like to share that Indigenous people are natural scientists. And I first heard that term um, in an Anishinaabe Moan class uh, years ago. And the teacher taught Anishinaabe Moan from this perspective that we are natural scientists and we look at the world with a lens of observation. And we don't just look at one thing, we look at how everything is connected, including ourselves in that space. And that's really how I've tried to um, continue doing this work over the years. So um, through that, I've had the pleasure of building many relationships with different First Nations communities uh, around primarily Southern Ontario. And there's still relationships that I value and honor to this day, um, yeah. and. Again, really excited to see so many people here today. Um, so I mentioned I'm from Neashinaningming, which is also known as the Chippewas of Nawash First Nation or Cape Croker. We've got lots of fun names. Um, typically when I share where I'm from with people who are non-Indigenous, I like to talk about it a little bit more in depth because as Indigenous people, we know how um, diverse and unique our own communities are but a lot of non-Indigenous people don't necessarily know that. So for me, I like to show a photo of my home territory. So this is a picture uh, that I took at the Grotto a couple years ago um, on the Bruce Peninsula. So my home community is on the Bruce Peninsula. Um, it's a very, very beautiful place. If you've never gone before, you should absolutely go. You can see we have these like crystal clear turquoise waters and that's what I grew up swimming in when we would go back home and visit the res um, and I I absolutely love it but what I like sharing about my home my home community is that our knowledges are so different so what I know and what I'm sharing is a product of all of my years of work uh, my relationships with people but also where I come from and the stories that I've learned growing up um, and the space that I am. So one example for me of how different our knowledges are and our spaces are is just how unique and um, clear the water is in my home territory. And you can see those white limestone cliffs in the background. And those actually help to filter out 
the water um, and make it really crystal clear. Whereas where I'm living now, up along the French River, we have lots of lakes and rivers that are quite dark in color. And it's because of all the tannins, as most of you know, from like the leaf litter and all of that stuff. So I really like to share that little tidbit about my home um, because it's unique and therefore my knowledge is unique and the people from my community have unique knowledge compared to other communities. And I think that's always a really important thing to start off with. Oh, I missed one. Um, so when you create space for Indigenous people, our worldview and our knowledges, you make space for incredible things to happen. I spend a lot of my work time um, talking with people who work in institutions and they're really wanting to engage Indigenous knowledge and Indigenous communities and bring more Indigenous science into their work. Um, and really, my answer is always that you just need to create space for us. Um, I really don't think that there's space for um, us to be teaching non-Indigenous communities or organizations how to do this work without them actually creating space to build meaningful relationships with us and our communities. Um, and I like to share a quote that I took from one of my mentors, Clint Jacobs, from a conference a couple of years ago. Um, it was in Toronto and we were talking, it was a it was a conversation that they were having on the stage about um, how to incorporate Indigenous knowledge in Western science. And he said uh, that we have to stop trying to fit Indigenous knowledge and science into Western science because it just will never ever fit. Um, and it shouldn't fit. What we should actually be doing is uplifting Indigenous knowledge and science to the same space that Western science is um, so that we can have that two-eyed seeing and when he said that we need to create space for Indigenous knowledge and science, it was kind of a light bulb moment for me because I had spent all of these years up till then, you know, helping and assisting and trying to be like, yeah, how are we going to fit Indigenous knowledge and science into Western science? And it just doesn't work. He was completely right. Um, so that's really how I conduct my work these days is that I really want to create space and see spaces being created for all of our beautiful work and knowledge um, because we need to. Moving forward with climate change and all of the things that we're facing, it's really important that we are taking up that space um, and, and honoring our knowledge in that way. So for me, um, my position at X University uh, is a really big example of that. Um, when my position was created before I was hired, and so I'm the first person in that position, so there was no programming pre-existing before I came in. And it's a really beautiful example of how institutions can make a meaningful change to start incorporating um, Indigenous knowledge and science. So my director, Dr. Emily Agard, had seen, you know, the next step we want to take is in Indigenous science outreach, and how are we going to do that? We're going to create a whole position for an Indigenous person to come in here. And the most important part about that was that she created and advocated um, for a full-time permanent position in our faculty. And uh, that's huge because I know many of you understand what it's like to work from the um, perspective of contracts and always trying to hustle to get enough money to be able to fund your own position and the work that you want to do. So um, I really do value and don't take for granted the position that I have because I've had to spend so many years doing that hustle to make sure that I would have um, a job moving forward. So it's really incredible to see institutions taking these next steps and I'm very hopeful that we'll continue to see that in the future. Um, so since joining uh, X University, I have uh, been able to create this program that we call Studis Science. And for those of you who don't know what the word Studis is, it's kind of like um, an indigenous slang word that lots of people know, which means let's do this. So Studis Science is the name that we put all of our indigenous science outreach under. And we've been able to do some really, really incredible outreach work with communities um, around Toronto and other places. 
uh, which include um, working with indigenous students who are studying neuroscience and being able to put together uh, workshops around learning about neuroscience for children and, and uh, other things that I'm gonna talk about after, like hide tanning. <laughs> so for me, hide tanning is a great example of indigenous science. Um, this is something that I have wanted to learn for many, many years. Um, one of my other mentors who's here today, Randy Rasool, shout out to Randy. Um, when I first started um, learning how to harvest with him, hunting and harvesting, one of the things that was on my mind was how can I utilize as much of um, anything that I do harvest as possible in a respectful and reciprocal way. And hide tanning is one of those things that was just way up there that I wanted to learn so that I could regain and reclaim that knowledge, but also be able to share it with my own community and with um, other people, other Indigenous people who want to learn this. Um, so I, my first, after my first year at working at Ryerson, we held our first on campus, as you can see right downtown. Um, and it was a really, really beautiful event. Since COVID, we haven't been able to host it in person. Uh, but we did have a really beautiful virtual hide camp, which you can find on our website if you're interested in looking at those videos and learning a bit more about hide tanning. Um, this is just such a beautiful way to introduce Indigenous science to everybody, to Indigenous people, to scientists who don't have an understanding of these concepts. Um, but what we do is every year during Science Literacy Week, which happens the third week in September, we plan to host a hide camp. So I hope this year we'll be able to host one in person again on campus. Um, but it also provides an opportunity for urban Indigenous folks who otherwise wouldn't have access to land or um, animals to be able to have access to hides to learn this knowledge. And um, it was a really incredible uh, community building space, which we held in conjunction with our powwow on campus. So lots of people were able to come by and see the process and learn about it. Um, I would not be anywhere near where I am today if it wasn't for the relationships that I've built over the years. So um, building relationships with communities and with individuals who have helped to mentor me um, have been just incredibly invaluable and really should be the focus on anybody's work who's trying to incorporate Indigenous knowledge and science into their programming. Um, for me, uh, basic, literally everything I've done is only because I've been able to build those relationships and also honor them. And not just with people, but also with the land. Um, I mentioned that I lived in Toronto for 15 years. And that was my home after going to university. It's where I um, had, you know, job prospects and opportunities. And with the pandemic, I was able to just be like, okay, I'm going to move up north because <laughs> um, I can work from home now. And it's been really exciting. I now live um, in the French River area, which is right near Randy Restool. And uh, I just feel such a connection with that land because of the time that I've been able to spend with it learning. Um, on that land and I'm so honored to be able to continue building that relationship in the best way possible, um, being there and spending time there. So I really try to make sure that I talk about my mentors a lot because that's part of our teachings is that we need to honor um, those people who have shared their gifts and their knowledge with us. So here are two examples of people who I'm gonna talk about today who have shared their knowledge with me. The first photo is my, my hide tanning mentor, Brenda Lee. Um, this is a photo from a Two-Spirit hide camp that we, we uh, had the honor of being instructors at this past summer. And uh, Brenda is, I've been learning um, hides with Brenda for a few years now. And I met her by chance at a beading symposium because I'm also a bead worker. So um, I went to the symposium and um, she was teaching a cool work workshop that I took and she handed everybody this beautiful little piece of 
material for us to work with. And she said it was home tanned hide that she tanned herself. And I was like blown away because I had mentioned before that high tanning is something I've always wanted to learn, but there hasn't really been people, um, especially down south or especially in my com home community who have been doing this work. Um, a lot of our knowledge around high tanning has been I don't want to say lost because we're regaining it. We're taking, we're taking it back and it's resurging, but it's just not been practiced for many years, a lot due to colonialism and um, especially in our Southern communities, our, you know, proximity to urban centers and that kind of thing. Um, I think a lot of us just didn't need to continue doing this type of work, but there's such a need for it now and you really do see it like kind of bursting at the seams and everybody's hide tanning and people are picking it up and it's really beautiful to see. But when I met Brenda, I asked her humbly if I could come and visit her at her place in um, near North Bay and help her with her hides. And that summer I spent many hours <laughs> traveling like the four and a half hours from Toronto um, to go up and work with Brenda on her hides and, and begin this practice. So uh, for me, really building relationships in that way is super important. Those are my teachings that I need to, you know, ask in respectful ways and also support them in the ways that I can too. So anytime I have a hide tanning camp and I can get Brenda in there as an instructor, she'll always be there. And then the other photo is of me and uh, my mentor, Helen Peltier, who this summer I was able to begin learning about harvesting birch bark and creating um, birch bark baskets with her. Um, we, I traveled to Fort William First Nation this past summer and was able to spend a week with her and it was just really beautiful and incredible. <clears throat> so here's some more photos from that trip. Um, I'm really new at harvesting and utilizing birch bark, so I won't talk about it too much because it's new meaning I'm just starting to develop my relationship with um, birch trees and I uh, look forward to a lifetime of, of upholding those responsibilities that I have to those trees and learning um, about all of the really incredible and magical things that they do for us. But it was a really eye-opening time and just time to spend in the land learning about birch harvesting and learning about um, harvesting black spruce roots. You can see my little hood. Um, this is midsummer, so the, the bugs are high, but that's the best time to be out harvesting. And uh, my mentor shared with me that you got to give a little to get a little. So <laughs> that's, that's what I keep in my head when I'm like, the mosquitoes and black flies are too bad. And I want to talk a little bit about hide tanning. Some of you might know this, but some of you might not. Um, and this is really what I'm super, super passionate about. Um, and I want to just talk about some of the steps and share some of the incredible science that goes into tanning a hide. <clears throat> so um, we start with a raw, with a fresh hide that's given to us. It still has like meat and flesh on it. So we have to flesh it, which is what Jean Marshall is doing in this photo on the left here. Um, and then we put the hide, if it's a deer hide, we put the hide through a process um, of that's called technically bucking, which means uh, basically swelling up the skin enough that the hair will start to fall out. So Traditionally, we would have used um, hardwood ash and water mixed together to soak our hide in before we scraped it. And that hardwood ash is actually a lye. It's the same thing we would use to like lye corn to make that beautiful hominy corn um, that we all love for our corn soups. So we do the same thing with deer hides. And what it helps to do is it helps to swell up all of the layers of skin um, on that hide and the hair starts slipping. So you know your hide's ready to work on when the hair starts falling out just by like pulling on it gently. And when the skin is that swollen, you can actually see the different layers um, 
on the epidermis. So you can see the grain layer and uh, the following layers, which makes it a lot easier to know what you're trying to scrape off and what you're trying to keep. Um, this is all a very uh, physically demanding and intense process, but also really beautiful. You learn a lot along the way. So after your hide is scraped, you then use the magic, which is actually the brains from the animal. So deer and moose have um, the perfect amount of fatty acids and chemicals in their own brains, because you know brains are really fatty, um, to tan their hide. And so what we're essentially doing here is we're making a mixture of brain and soap um, and water, and it's so like an emulsion mixture that we then spread all over the hide, which like this photo here. And uh, when we spread that on the hide, essentially what that what the fats are doing is they're helping to break down all of the collagen fibers that make up the skin. And we wanna we want it to be broken down enough that we can soften that skin and change it from its raw hide form to a softened um, piece of leather that's usable and, and workable. So after that, um, it goes through a softening process and you can see with the one photo on the left here, there's two sets of hands and some poles and a couple of people wringing out this hide. So that's the first step after braining is you would wring it out, get all the moisture out of the hide and then we string it up on frames like this and we have to work the hide until it's completely dry. So it's a very um, physically demanding process, but essentially what we're doing when we're working that hide while it's drying is we're ensuring that those collagen fibers don't dry stiff to one another. And as they're being worked, as it's drying, they're being broken. They're breaking up and splitting and uh, leaving us with a really soft, beautiful material. If you've never held home tan hide before, I hope you get an opportunity to do it because it's just so, so different than um, commercially tanned hide. It's much easier to bead on, to sew with. It's all natural as well. So, uh, you know, there's not a lot of harmful chemicals that are used to um, create this leather, unlike commercially tanned hides that are often used today. And then the final process in, in um, hide tanning is smoking. So you can leave your hide uh, white if you want. You don't have to smoke it. Um, but what the smoking does is it actually seals in all your work. It cures the brains that are within that hide and it uh, gives it weatherproofness. So you can see in this one photo, um, there's someone bending down with a bucket what we do is we sew the hides into what's called a smoke sack and we hang them on a tripod like that set up there um, and we put a, a, a metal bucket underneath with hot coals in the bottom and then we cover it with the wood that we're using to smoke the hides. Um, the wood that we use is uh, punky spruce is what I've been told is the best. Um, but we use punky wood. So that's like, you know, when you're walking through the forest and you find a log that's just, you could touch it and it just falls apart. That's exactly what we're looking for. That point of rot that it's just crumbly um, is the perfect point of wood to use for this process. And one of the reasons why we really like to use spruce is because it has a lot, it contains a lot of resins, like tree resins. Um, and when you put that punky spruce on top of the coals, the, it burning and like creating smoke is releasing those resins and coating the entire hide with those resins. So it turns it this beautiful smoky color, which we know um, that color of tanned hide, home tanned hide, and it gives it um, a weatherproof and waterproof protectiveness. So after that, hides can get wet or be washed and still maintain their um, flexibility and softness. It's a really incredible and beautiful process. Um, and there's so much more that goes into it. Like these are just the basic steps of 
tanning a deer hide, not a moose hide because moose hides are quite different. Um, but there's so much science in every single step of the way that it really is truly a beautiful way to showcase indigenous knowledge and science. Um, I mentioned that moose hides are very different. And this year, since moving up north, I've been able to start practicing learning moose hides. So I'm still in my phase of learning and um, developing that relationship. But I've been lucky enough to be given a bunch of moose hides from hunters that I know in the area and uh, working with them. And this winter, um, following the guidance of some of my other mentors and friends who do high tanning, um, I've tried winter scraping um, hides, which is really, really incredible. So moose is different than deer. We can't really soak it in a lye solution to help slip the hair. We actually have to like scrape it off and cut it off with knives. So it's a lot more physically demanding than working with um, a deer hide. Not only is it way bigger, but it's a lot thicker. So um, in winter, there's this process we can enter in called frost scraping. And we soak the hide till it's nice and hydrated for about like two days, and then string it up on a frame, just like in that photo there, and we let it freeze. And the key to this is making sure we have temperatures that are about minus 15 at the warmest um, for when we're gonna be scraping. And the hide will freeze with all of that moisture in it. And because it's moist and um, swollen, you can visibly see the layers of skin a lot better than when it's just dry. So what I've been learning this year is that probably a lot of our moose hide tanning specifically would have happened in the winter time because it is a lot easier to um, work on moose hides, know what we're scraping off, and uh, it's a lot more pleasant than working in the heat when you have bugs and all those lovely, beautiful hide tanning and animal smells that we get from this process too. Um, but you can see the photo on the right uh, kind of showcases um, the layers that you can visibly see when it's frozen. So there's no hair on there, although on the left you can see some of the hair follicles and that little smooth patch um, kind of near the center there, that is exactly what we're looking for when we're scraping off that grain layer, so that thick part of the skin, so that we can then brain tan it. Um, all of this work is so connected. And I think, you know, part of the reason why I wanted to share my story of, of how I have come to this work today is that everything is connected. Even though I studied Canadian history, that knowledge has really lent itself to the work that I continue to do today and will always be a big part of how I got here. And, you know, it's really in line with how um, we're taught that like our knowledge systems aren't linear. Um, they're really holistic and everything does have a connection. So for me, that's really what it, it comes down to when it comes to this work. And these photos are such a beautiful example of that. One of the things while I'm working on hides, um, one of the things that I focus on is trying to ensure that I'm utilizing more of animals that I'm harvesting, my family or friends are harvesting, um, and also treating those beings with respect. And that means any of the leftovers go back to the bush, whether that's the hair or the scrapings or whatever. And uh, this year while I was in Fort William First Nation, learning about birch bark harvesting, we were really, really deep in the bush, like deep in thick, thick bush. And I just looked up for one second and right in front of my face was this beautiful hummingbird nest. And I love hummingbirds. I have such a connection to them. They were my Nokomis's favorite birds. She, her house always had hummingbird feeders around and I have some bit, very vivid memories as a child of being there and like watching her chase bears away with a broomstick <laughs> from her hummingbird feeders. Um, so when I looked at these, I was just in awe. I saw this and I never thought I would be able to see one of these because they're so elusive. Um, and I was amazed that it was like right at eye level too. But it was deep in the bush, so well hidden. 
And when I looked at it up close, I could see that it utilized a lot of moose hair in the building and weaving of its nest. And it just made me feel um, really happy that we can utilize more of the things that we're harvesting and that by even tanning a moose hide and then taking the hair and putting it back into the bush, there's other beings that are going to be using that. Or even if it just biodegrades and goes back to the earth and provides um, nutrients to the earth, everything that we do is connected and has an impact on the environment. And I truly do believe that hide tanning um, has a very positive impact for the environment, not only for the fact that we are honoring these animals, but things like um, ticks, for example, which as we're seeing temperatures warm up um, more and more, we are seeing more and more ticks on our animals. So moose and deer have more and more ticks. And this year, I was quite shocked to have to deal with some um, tick apocalypses at my place with some fresh hides. Um, but those are really key indicators that our animals are not having access to the cold temperatures that they need to sort of refresh and renew and kill off all of those, um, all of those things that bug them and that are eating them. Um, so hide tanning is also a really beautiful way that we can think about how when we're connected working on these animals, how we're actually learning about the environment that we're living in too. Um, these, are, these are really key indicators for um, climate change monitoring. And I really love seeing more communities picking up this knowledge um, and having hide camps and sharing it because I think that we will have a better understanding and a better relationship with those beings the more we actually get to work with them one-on-one -on -one like this. I also do fish skin tanning. Um, here's me <laughs> with a couple fish that I got to catch a couple years ago. Um, I try to salvage skins from wherever I can. So in Toronto, I was taking them from, I was taking salmon skins from sushi restaurants. And now that I'm up north, I have friends and family that have fish camps and I ask them to save the skins for me when they catch their fish. And uh, it's, it's a really beautiful process again of reclaiming things that would just be um, gone to waste or people put back to the bush that can be utilized in an incredible way. Most people don't think of fish as having like the toughest skin to be able to make leather out of, but it's actually the opposite. So fish skin, I wish I had a diagram of this, but fish skin, all of its collagen fibers that make up the skin are actually incredibly tight. So they're woven like a basket almost. Um, and it's called a regular weave. And deer and moose hides, collagen fibers, are called an irregular weave. So they're kind of just squiggly all over the place. And if you were to look at it under a microscope, you would see that. So with a piece of deer or moose hide that's home tanned, like you can, if you were to try really hard, you can tear it apart and see those strands come apart. But with fish hide, because it has that regular weave, it's incredibly strong. Um, and so some people say it's even stronger than moose hide. Uh, and you, know, you could like pull a car with it kind of thing. Um, but for me, learning this knowledge was really important because my community is a fishing community and my family have been fisher people for many generations. So um, learning how to utilize more of the harvest that we have is really important and it kind of lends great to fish skin. Fish skin is something you can easily do in your house with very minimal um, tools basically stuff that you already have in your kitchen. So it's very easy to teach. I've had the honor of um, sharing fish skin tanning with communities like Magnetowan or Shawnaga. Um, and uh, even some other communities in line with their fish harvesting, um, spear fishing. So the people who spear fish will save all the skins. And then those who want to learn how to tan them uh, will take a workshop with me and it's been really incredible to just watch that whole process unfold. Another really beautiful thing about working on hides and community is just the knowledge that comes back from it. Um, so the one example I'll share about fish skins specifically 
is uh, I was working on a workshop in Tyendinaga First Nation and um, we were working on our fish skins. I forget what type of fish they had there, but it must have been pickerel or something. And sometimes um, our local fish have really strong scales that are hard to get out. And during the process of tanning, we have to take the scales off. And uh, one participant's parent was there at the workshop watching and commented after that he had a memory of his mom tanning fish skin when he was a little kid. And he remembered that she actually would clean the fish skin and then leave it to dry like a piece of rawhide. And then once it was dry, the scales would come out really, really easily so that she could move on to the next phase of tanning it. And I just like, that was so beautiful to be able to um, provide an opportunity for this family to be together um, and re remember those stories and pick that that knowledge back up was, is really special. Um, what got me into working on fish skins was actually that my home community and Magnetowan First Nation are some of the last places with Massasauga um, rattlesnake populations. And they're very meaningful beings, obviously, to a lot of us and to a lot of our communities. And I thought about Meg and purposefully because I think of, you know, all the tracking and all of the road mortality studies that they've done over 10 years and their freezer full of unfortunate um, road mortality victims and how we could actually utilize those skins um, and repurpose them to honor those beings a little bit better. So I got into fish skin tanning because I really wanted to learn how to tan snake skins, which is essentially the same thing as fish skins. Um, it's still a process that I'm working on and I hope to be able to expand upon in the future. Um, but again, it's just about being able to honor the beings in these ways. Um, I have found a few archival photographs of regalia and um, outfits that are in museum collections that did utilize fish skin um, and snake skin. Um, and they're Anishinaabe specific from the Great Lakes areas. So they, we definitely utilize these things, but it's been a really beautiful process of um, reclaiming this knowledge and being able to share that with other communities. is just like feeding my soul. Um, here are some photos of like the finished product. So the first photo is um, a piece of deer hide that is home tanned and that beautiful golden color is just stunning. The smell, I wish, you, I wish we had smell vision so that you could smell how beautiful and smoky that hide smells. And then a pair of baby moccasins that I made for my friend um, and her young child. Uh, utilizing deer hide that I tanned myself and fish skins that I tanned myself. Um, so there's lots of ways that we can use these things in continuing our culture by creating um, pieces like this that are just gifting back to our community and seeing kids walking in moccasins that are made of traditional materials is like the most incredible thing. And then the middle picture is a photo of my little niece, Riley. Um, after learning how to har harvest birch bark this year, I was so excited to make her a little berry picking basket. Um, in my backyard, we have lots of raspberries. So she got to come up and learn how to pick berries this year. And uh, it's these kinds of things that for me, being able to do my day-to-day -day work and share how meaningful Indigenous knowledge and science is, but then also being able to apply that to my own life and family is very, very important. Um, and seeing my niece grow up with around this and with this knowledge is so important because I would have never imagined as a child that I would have that opportunity. Oh, I guess that's it. That's all that it's gonna let me do. Um, I realize I haven't filled up my full hour yet, but I hope people have questions. I would really love to um, talk a little bit more about uh, high tanning or fish skin tanning if people are interested in it. And uh, yeah, happy to answer any questions that I can.
Make much, Amber. That was awesome. I've seen some comments come through the chat of how fascinating um, and inspirational that was. Uh, also, there are some questions in the, in the Q&A. So the first question that we got toward the beginning of your presentation um, was if, could a definition of indigenous science be provided? Thank you. I'm sure you have a great answer for that. Um, well, I choose to use the term indigenous science because it just, indigenous knowledge is also very powerful, those words. But when we talk about Western science, we, we give it this like air of understanding that like Western science knows all of these things. And we have indigenous science too. So for me, that's exactly what it is. It's our knowledge, our sciences, um, and just a way to like say it in English that that puts it on the same platform as Western science. Thank you. Um, another question, um, do the ticks affect the tanning process or impact the finish hide negatively? No, they don't. Um, hmm. Ticks don't really go below the layer that we're scraping off anyway. It's more the health and safety of people who are tanning the hides fresh. Um, that can be the issue. Um, and then also, you know, I mentioned, it's really important that we honor those beings by putting back anything into the bush. So one example this year is like, one hide I got that was completely covered in ticks. Many of the hides I got, to be completely honest, many of the hides I got this year were so covered in ticks that it shocked me. Um, I've seen ticks on hides in the past, but not to this degree. And they were coming from all around the Sudbury area in different places. Um, the worst one came from Killarney area and uh, it was just so infested. Like there's no way you could even count how many ticks were on it. Um, the only way you can do it to kill them really is to freeze the hide before you're going to work on it for at least um, a couple of days. I like to try to freeze them for a few weeks now. Um, but when it's fresh and you need to get rid of that hair, the only way to kill those hides is with fire. So I had a big stinky hair burning fire this year um, that I'm sure <laughs> disturbed maybe some of my neighbors. But I think that, you know, that action of making sure we take care to to kill those ticks that are on that hide instead of putting them back into the bush is really important because we're helping to have a hand and not continue uh, to let those, those ticks live or give them an opportunity to find another animal. Yeah, it doesn't impact the, the hide like um, a bot fly or something from more Northern areas would. That's really interesting, thanks. Um. We have two more questions up here. What are the best fish skins to work with? <laughs> all fish skins are good to work with. Um, they all make really, really cool leather. I haven't done sturgeon leather because obviously they are very, sturgeon are not a fish that we go out and catch all the time. Um, but they, for example, have a very different unique skin and um, scale patterns. So I think they would be a little bit different to tan but every other fish is really easy and makes a beautiful, beautiful leather. Um, sometimes the, depending on the type of fish changes the thickness. The type of tanning that I do for my fish skins is called bark tanning. So um, the bark tannins help to thicken up the skin and make it a much more thicker material than what it starts off as. Um, so a walleye, for example, would be a thinner leather than a piece of salmon, but still a thick enough leather to use for like moccasin vamps or a wallet or that kind of thing. That's a good segue into the next question or, or one question on here. What are some examples of uses for fish skin leather? You just kind of rhymed some off. Yeah, I, I love I love that question because anytime I talk about fish skins, people are like, oh, what do you use that leather for? And the answer is anything you would use regular leather for. Um, it's really versatile. It's really flexible. Um, it 
even has a bit of like weatherproofness to it. Um, if you finish it with a bit of like beeswax afterwards, I personally love using it for the vamps of moccasins because it sh helps to show like the beautiful scale pocket patterns on the skin. And uh, I really like using it for wallets because it's just such a durable material. Like I explained the woven pattern really lends itself to being a leather that's going to stand up to um, constant use and kind of abuse for many, many years to come. Cool. Uh, I noticed in the picture that you put up with your niece, who is beautiful, by the way, um, that those moccasins actually looked so cool that you could see, like you said, the pockets um, and the just like the pattern on there. Yeah, yeah. They're um, really special. Yeah. And can I say it doesn't smell after if anybody was wondering that if that was a question in anyone's mind, they don't smell after we had um, Amber uh, work with one of our staff here who did um, fish tanning and just saying doesn't smell after. <laughs> <laughs> um, so another question here, were ticks found on hides all year or just a certain time of the year? Well, the hides that I got this year were all during the harvesting season, so um, in the fall. And I do expect ticks to be on hides for sure. You know, there's always going to be some of them, but just the amount of infestation this past year was pretty shocking. Um, and I know that kind of across, even up in northern Ontario, like Thunder Bay area, there was people dealing with really tick-filled hides up there too. That is unfortunate because uh, we know the effect that that's having on our, on our moose. So, Ooh, this is a cool question. Is the process the same for tanning beaver tails? It is. It is. Cool. I, I've worked on a beaver tail. It's really fun. Um, it's a little different because they, beaver tails have these really interesting scales on the outside that you have to slough off. Um, and it's a bit more of a stiff material once it's finished being tanned, like it's less pliable, I guess, than um, fish skin, but it's really cool. And definitely if you trap beavers or uh, you know somebody who does and they don't utilize the tails, those skins are definitely great to experiment with tanning. And if anybody's interested, I have on my Instagram page, I have um, a tutorial. It's like a little step-by-step -step tutorial that you can learn how to tan fish skins on your own. Um, I'll just type my handle in the chat so that you can go see. And it's saved under um, fish skins and you'll be able to do it. It's basically all you need is everything you have at home and then a bunch of bags of black tea to be able to uh, imitate bark in the beginning. While you were in the chat, I noticed that somebody mentioned uh, they're, they have some resources that you could utilize. So that's awesome. Look at you. Ooh, amazing. <laughs> yes. It's Nikki. Oh, it was Nikki. Perfect. All Thank right. Thank you so, so much, everybody, for your comments. I've read them all. It's bringing a giant smile to my face. It's always ner more nerve wracking to present to a group of your peers than it is to present to a group of like, you know, non Indigenous people who are wanting to learn. So, I really appreciate being asked to be here today. Um, yeah, Miigwech. Thank you so much. Uh, while you were speaking, you made me think of the time that I seen you last in Sudbury. You handed me a piece of leather that must have just been completed. It smelled so good. You talked about how it smelled, how we should have smell-o-vision. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I was lucky enough to be able to, to definitely smell what you had handed me and it is so strong and it was so soft, just like you explained. So yeah, thanks for your excitement and, uh, and for your presentation, this is really great. Miigwech. And thank you to all of our presenters today. I have learned so much from everybody today and I hope everybody else learned a lot too. Um, I'm gonna, I'm going to pass it over to Alana, who is going to tell us a little bit about uh, tomorrow and what we can expect then. Miigwech to all our speakers. Miigwech, Sam. Um, yeah, I, I just want to reiterate everything that Samantha just said. To miigwech to all of our speakers. Uh, to Amber for being our keynote. Um, just incredible, incredible talks and 
um, an incredible opportunity for all of our attendees and participants to learn. Um, so to me, to, to everyone. Uh, so just before we hop off, there's a few last minute things I want to do, including a very special song that we're going to be sharing to close uh, the day today. But before we do that, um, I just want to emphasize that if you missed any part of today or would like to rewatch some of these amazing presentations, we're going to be sharing the YouTube recordings from today and tomorrow in our follow up email, along with some of the resources that have been shared in the chat throughout the day and any contact information from our speakers um, that they would like to share. So I'm just going to share my screen really quickly um, with the agenda just to emphasize again tomorrow. Um, so we're going to start again tomorrow at nine in the morning. In the afternoon is when we're going to be hosting the Zoom meeting. We strongly encourage you all to come. It's a great opportunity. We did this last year and I had an absolute blast getting to know everybody um, and getting to speak with you all. Um, and we'll have both the presenters in, in different rooms, but um, members of our team are also going to be there moderating the chat and helping with any um, IT problems. So now that we've kind of come to the end of uh, the webinar today, it's an honor. I'm going to welcome Alan back over here to introduce um, the closing song that we have today. Me. Mm -hmm. Um, so we we're lucky enough to have Lana hit us up at the high school to um, request a drum song. So we picked the repeater. It was taught to us by Rodney Stranger. And this was a really special time for us because we did this recording without any adults, without any teachers. And it went pretty great. And we're excited to share it with you all. Thanks again. Much, Alan, um, and I can't say enough how proud I am of, of those boys for pulling together and uh, recording this for us. So it is my honor to share this song with you, and I hope you will enjoy. And I look forward to seeing everybody back tomorrow.
Miigwech, everyone. See everybody tomorrow.